Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back for day two of our Women's Air and Space Power Symposium. Yesterday, we provided you with a picture of how gender roles have evolved over the history of the Department of the Air Force. Well, today, we're going to shape that conversation into how that evolution has impacted our brothers and sisters across the service through personal stories of resilience how our mindsets have adapted to this evolution in good and bad ways, and how that has forced policy changes across the Department of the Air Force. Today's theme is titled Soaring Beyond. Thank you. Good morning. What an honor it is to be here standing in front of you, all of these amazing women and allies. I'm Chief Master Sergeant Chris Dawson. I'm from the 150th Special Operations Wing, New Mexico. And I'm also a leader in the Department of Air Force WIT uh, on the Anthropometrics LOE. Today I'll be your moderator, and uh, we're going to talk about resilience in this session. Resilience is often defined as the ability to recover from life's challenges and hardships. People who are resilient are often said to bounce back from adversity. The Space Force's lines of efforts fundamentally lead into today's discussion. With that in mind, our first speaker will lead us in a discussion through the three Space Force LOEs and introduce us to some amazing women in history, as well as some incredible women panelists that we'll have here for you today. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Chief Operations Officer, United States Space Force, Lieutenant General Deanna Burt. All right. How are we this morning? This is pretty cool. It's never bad to be out of the Pentagon. Uh, good morning, and thank you, Chief Dawson. Uh, I just hope you guys will humor me. I have some uh, written comments that I'll go through pretty quickly because I really want to get to. Uh, your comments, but a, a lot of to cover here. Uh, so again, it's better if I read and not freewheel and we get there to the questions quicker. Uh, I'm proud to be here today starting off day two of what has already been a great event. I talked to General Miller last night. Uh, I want to say thank you to General Miller for the opportunity to be here with you today uh, and his team for putting on this event. Uh, Stronger Together is the perfect theme for an event like this. It sends an important message, not just to women, not just to the military, but to anyone who strives to make our country stronger. We can accomplish more together than we can accomplish by ourselves. Together we are stronger than the sum of our parts. Think of your mentors, role models, family, friends, coworkers, subordinates, and peers. They all form a support system critical to your success, as I know they have for me. I can assure you, uh, they are critical to you every day to achieve what you do. As an undergraduate student at Embry-Riddle, I recognize the need to form strong bonds early on to be successful. I worked together with the provost to put together the Women's Programming Board with a stated mission of encouraging friendships and aviation career aspirations for women on campus. My time at the ROTC unit further demonstrated the need for teamwork. Early on, I was convinced four years was going to be enough of the military for me. <laughs> Obviously that failed. But the camaraderie fellowship mission and the knack for space operations proved otherwise. I took each opportunity offered to me to build up those around me, from my crew commander time as a lieutenant to multiple command assignments to my current position as the chief operations officer in the Space Force. I have an opportunity every day that I take very seriously to create positive relationships and to do so for each of you. We all have an opportunity every day to build up others and be stronger together. With that, I want to take a few minutes this morning to discuss the Space Force lines of effort, how they tie into our core values, and a few of the women who best embody those values. When General Saltzman took over as the Chief of Space Operations, he began to release a series of C notes to Guardians. His second note, three years of learning, outlined three lines of effort for the service. He challenged the Space Force and its Guardians to field combat ready forces, amplify the Guardian spirit, and partner to win. 
A closer look shows that each line of effort is packed with meaning. Fielding combat ready forces is the purpose of a military service. It's why we exist. We present forces to the US combatant commands around the world so they can accomplish their assigned missions. But what does combat ready really mean in the Space Force? Combat ready to a guardian means three conditions have been met. Our forces must be resilient, ready, and combat credible. A resilient force can withstand, fight through, and recover from an attack. It means we can take a punch, roll with it, and fight back as necessary. A ready force has the training, equipment, and sustainment necessary to accomplish their task or mission. Simply put, we have what we need to accomplish national objectives. A combat credible force has demonstrated the ability to conduct operations against an adversary, offensive, and defensive. We have to show, not tell. These basic building blocks, when combined, result in a combat ready force. Line of effort two, amplifying the guardian spirit, simply breaks down into three components. When we say we want guardians to amplify the guardian spirit, we mean guardians who are public, public principled servants, space-minded warfighters, and bold and collaborative problem solvers. As principled public servants, we must provide selfless public service. It is the foundation of our organization and represents a key piece of why the American people put their trust in the military. As a space-minded warfighter, we must have a deep understanding of our domain, space operations, and what we bring to the fight. As bold and collaborative problem solvers, we must not be afraid to push against boundaries and to question what we have always done. The way we've always done it will not be good enough in the era of great power competition. We have to push limits, and we cannot do it alone. That brings me to LOE3, partnering to win. This line of effort is most often linked to our commercial and international partners, but it is also critical to cultivate partnerships within the Department of Defense, across the other services, and within our own service. Partnerships are part of our core structure as a service. Many of you know that the Space Force relies heavily on the Air Force for our critical infrastructure and sustainment forces. We don't have space cops or space docs. Our partnership with the Air Force ensures our success. We, in turn, partner with the other services as part of the Joint Force to provide the capabilities they need to be successful. These partnerships are a benefit to all of us. The CSO gave us a short to-do list, but not an easy one. To get after these lines of effort, the Space Force must have a solid foundation. One that all Guardians share, the Space Force's four core values lay the foundation to accomplish the service's lines of effort. Our values are character, connection, commitment, and courage. There are plenty of examples of women throughout history who have demonstrated these values, but these that I'm gonna share with you are a few of my favorites. So please, there are a lot out there that represent these four core values, uh, but these are four that hit me pretty close to home. The first, Dr. Mary Edwards Walker, was a woman of character. People of character like Dr. Walker remain true to their values and can be trusted to do the right thing regardless of the circumstances. Dr. Walker displayed this value every day of her extraordinary life. Growing up on a farm, she saw both of her parents work on the farm and in the home, which helped her build strong ideas about gender roles, ideas that were unusual for the mid-1800s. She further built on those ideas and never allowed what was considered proper to stop her from doing what she thought was right. How many can relate to that? That's right. She graduated with honors as the only woman in her class from Syracuse Medical College and opened a joint practice with her husband despite societal pressures against women serving as surgeons. When the Civil War began in 1861, Dr. Walker answered the call to serve and volunteered as a civilian surgeon. She originally applied to be a surgeon in the Army, hoping to serve as a uniformed member of the military. But the rules at the time required that she serve as a nurse. Women were not allowed to be surgeons. Women, remember, were only allowed to fly in combat since 1993 and to serve as ground combatants since 2015. But Dr. Walker, a woman ahead of her time, knew where she could do the most good, so she volunteered to be a civilian instead as a surgeon. Known for crossing battle lines to treat soldiers and civilians, she was captured in 1864 and was held as a prisoner of war for four months by Confederate forces. 
1865, Dr. Walker was awarded the Medal of Honor for her bravery in treating the wounded over the course of the war. She remains the only, let me say that again, the only woman to have ever been awarded the Medal of Honor, and interestingly, is the only one, only one of eight civilians to receive this highest decoration of valor. Being awarded the Medal of Honor alone makes Dr. Walker an amazing woman. But after the war, she, was also, she also went on to be a part of the women's suffrage movement. Further, she wrote numerous pieces on issues related to women's health care and dress reform, and despite social pressures, refused to wear what was considered proper attire at the time. She instead chose comfort and ease of movement in her dress. Dr. Mary Walker shows us what we can accomplish when we do what we know is right and lead according to our convictions. Today, we ask our guardians to demonstrate character above all, as Mary Edwards Walker did. As a result, character is our first guardian value. Our second guardian value is connection, specifically connection towards unity, the difference between a group of individuals Existing in a shared space and a team is the connection the individuals have to one another. Astronauts, for example, are always sent to space as part of a team. Sally Ride and Eileen Collins, two incredible astronauts, are examples of women who made impressive strides in space travel while cultivating the teams they were a part of. For those that may not know, Sally Ride was the first American woman in space. She also helped develop the robotic arm uh, for the space shuttle. She was selected to serve on the Space Transport System 7 mission, or STS-7, because of her familiarity with the robotic arm and, according to several sources, her agreeable personality and ability to work with others. She had the right mix of technical know-how and the ability to connect with people. Thanks to Dr. Ride's contributions, STS-7 was a huge success. Not only did her crew deploy two communications satellites, but they also deployed and then recaptured a satellite. It was the first time that had ever been done, and it paved the way for some of the concepts we use today in satellite development. Dr. Wright is a tested and committed team builder, also went on to take part in the Challenger and Columbia disaster investigations as part of the Rogers Commission and the Columbia Accident Investigation Board, respectively. In both instances, her experience, expertise, and nature, and good nature, helped those teams determine the causes of each disaster while framing a path forward at a critical moment in our history of spaceflight. Eileen Collins has similarly has a decorated background. Not only was she the first woman to pilot the space shuttle, but she was also the first to be named mission commander of a shuttle mission. She was also the first woman to perform a rendezvous maneuver as a pilot of the shuttle and the first mission commander to perform a 360 degree rendezvous pitch maneuver. Eileen flew on the shuttle four times. She was a member of four different teams commanding two of them. During each mission, her relationship and expertise were critical to our team's success. The, imp the important piece here is that these women achieve greatness as part of a team. Both women were smart, talented, and successful, but neither could have achieved what they did alone. They built connection towards unity. The Space Force's third value is commitment. Commitment to mastery. Commitment means not giving up, nor giving in. It means staying the course and seeing it through to the end. Commitment to mastery means consistently pursuing excellence. It means recognizing ours as a lifelong journey. Few represent this lifelong commitment to excellence better than justice than Joan Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Her example represents a commitment to mastery a guardians can aspire to. Ruth experienced and overcame gender inequality throughout her early career. That included, included trouble landing an initial clerk position despite graduating, uh, graduating tied for first in her class from Columbia University. Never one to be held down, she became one of the only 20 female law professors in the United States in 1963. Think about that, 20 in the entire nation. And became the first female tenured professor at Columbia in 1972. She stayed committed to mastery despite her hardships. She went on to lead and fight against gender discrimination in the Supreme Court. She personally argued six, six different cases in front of the Supreme Court and won five of them. That's a pretty good record. It is worth noting that Ginsburg fought for more than women's rights. Her cases at the Supreme Court featured both male and female plaintiffs. Her goal was justice, plain and simple. 
Through her extensive knowledge of civil law, her experiences in other parts of the world, and her personal understanding of inequality, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a force to be reckoned with when she finally became a Supreme Court Justice. She was, the only, she was only the second female Supreme Court Justice to have served at the time of her appointment. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg served on the Supreme Court until the day she died. And in her own words, she said she would remain a member of the court as long as she can do the job with full steam. I take personal inspiration from another quote of hers, and it sits on my desk uh, in the Pentagon, and I think you will find it's appropriate for what I do every day in the Pentagon. Fight for the things that you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. She was committed to mastery all the days of her life. Our final guardian value is courage. Courage is to be bold. Cornelia Fort is an ex excellent example of courage. In 1941, Cornelia earned her pilot's license in Tennessee and went on to secure her instructor license a month later in March. After searching across the country, she found an instructor pilot position here in Colorado and stayed here for several months before accepting a position in Honolulu. As it turned out, uh, Hawaii in 1941 was a harrowing place to be. Cornelia Fort was in the air with a student on December 7th in an intent interstate uh, in an interstate cadet aircraft. That's a small engine single aircraft similar to a Cessna. She caught sight of a fighter moving towards her at a high rate of speed. She immediately assumed control of the aircraft from her student to avoid a collision and recognized the emblem on the offending fighter as belonging to the Empire of Japan. Cornelia Fort looked towards Pearl Harbor and saw the smoke that announced the beginning of the historic attack, becoming one of the first witnesses to that attack. Throughout her life, she proved to naysayers that women could pilot aircraft and could do so just as well as their male counterparts. She reinforced that message through her actions at a time when society believed it to be improper for a woman to serve in her key aviation roles. What is kind of, that kind of courage we ask guardians to lead with each and every day? Courage to speak out against injustice and to fight for what you think is right. Cornelia Fort became a member of the Women Auxiliary Ferry Service, and it was during her time ferrying military aircraft that she became the first female pilot casualty on active duty. I saw a quote from her recently that said, if I'm to die violently, who can say it's before my time? And she was, quote, happiest in the sky. Her life was one of, the res one of resisting norms, just like the other women I've mentioned this morning. And Cornelia gave her life blazing a path for other women to serve. She did what she loved, even though it was not typical, and she had the courage to be bold. I bring up each of these examples to serve as a backdrop for the rest of the remarkable people you're going to hear on this stage today. The panel today are made up of warfighters who are leaders of character, who build teams connected toward unity, who are committed to mastering their craft, and who have the courage to be bold in the face of adversity. These women and men I am proud of to serve for and with every day. Thank you for your time and attention today. Uh, to close, I will leave you with this. Believe in yourself, set your goals high, and viciously prioritize to achieve them. Remember that you are your only limit. Fights on. Thank you, General Byrd. Uh, those stories will resonate with me, and I'm certain uh, resonate with the, uh, with the audience long after your speech today. Next, I would like to uh, introduce you to some amazing women and leaders uh, who will share their personal stories of resilience with you. Today, we have Brigadier General Regina Sabrick, Commander, 10th Air Force, Naval Air Station Joint Reserve Base, Fort Worth, Texas and the Air Force's Reserve's first F-35 female pilot. <laughs> Next we have Brigadier General Amy Hallbeck, Chief of Staff for the Georgia Air National Guard, first female uh, general officer in Georgia to serve in the headquarters environment. We heard about the next guest, the next panelist yesterday, Colonel Allison Black, 
The former commander of the 1st Special Operations Wing, Herbert Field, Florida, she became known as the Angel of Death over the battlefields after 9-11. and carving a legacy in Air Force and Special Warfare history, along with memorable milestone for women in modern combat. Our final panelist today is Colonel Jamie Jamison, Director of Plans, Programs, Headquarters, 11th Air Force, Joint Elmendorf, Richardson, Alaska. Throughout her aviation journey, throughout her aviation journey, she's flown many different variants of aircraft and is the first female operational F-22 pilot. Ladies, it's an honor. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start, and then we're going to go down the panel. They warned us it was bright up here. They weren't kidding. It's like the sun. Um, so first, thanks for having us today. Uh, we're all super excited to be here and be able to talk to all the airmen and guardians and everybody else out there. Um, I think we're going to each share some uh, stories of resiliency, and then we'll get up to the questions. So for me, uh, when I hear the term resiliency, often things come to mind to me, not necessarily positive, right? I equate it to needing to get over something or needing to pick yourself up and dust yourself off and keep on going. There are things that are all part of resiliency that make incredible and significant um, things that our airmen have overcome, significant resilient stories. I'm in awe of everything that some airmen have done and guardians to get over this. When I think of such things, I don't have that one defining big resilient moment. Um, I don't have the huge life altering moments, but to me resiliency also is how do you get over something after you were thrown a loop or something didn't go your way. In the fighter world, we talk about jinx. Um, so, and I have a few jinx that certainly have shaped me. So in fighters, when we're getting shot out, you need to jink out of the way and re-vector yourself to survive. So to me, I kind of equate that to the same thing. When I think on back on my career, I've had a few jinx that I've had to re-vector myself and kind of reposition where I want to be. So as you know, everything d always happens for a reason and it doesn't really go with what you have planned. And sometimes that's okay. You don't really see it when it happens, but you see it later. And I'm proof of that, of not everything went the way I planned it, but I couldn't be happier with where it ended. Um, so as we talk about some of my stuff, I'll, I'll talk about some of my jinx in my career. So my first jinx, jinx number one, uh, no pilot slots. When I got in the Air Force in 1996, I went through officer training school, and there weren't any pilot slots available. So I got sent to navigator training and went to be an F-15E weapon system officer. It wasn't my plan. I didn't want to be a navigator, I wanted to be a pilot. But that was okay. Put my head down, pressed forward, and went on. I got checked out in the Strike Eagle, joined my squadron downrange, and flew my first mission-ready sortie in Operation Allied Force. Um, got to drop bombs, got shot at, all that kind of stuff. I will tell you, had I went directly into pilot training, who knows what squadron I would have been to. Would they have been in combat at the time? I don't know. I may not have gotten that. Uh, opportunity. So jink number one led to combat sorties, coalition experiences as a lieutenant. It doesn't really get much better than that in the flying world. Uh, it also prepared me for pilot training, which I did next. For the next couple assignments in the F-16, I learned a lot, and I wanted to share my experiences in the fighter community. I want to start off by saying I've been in the Air Force for about 28 years. Um, I love the Air Force. I love serving. I love being a part of something bigger. I've loved all my assignments, even the ones in the Pentagon and the staff tour, which is hard to say, uh, but it's true. I've, I've loved all of my different assignments because they've all been different. Every, everybody, though, here has their tribes, right? And for me, my tribe is the fighter pilot tribe. I've grown up in the fighter community since 1996. And while you might hear some negative things about how hard it is and it's a boys club and how poorly females are treated, I'm not one of them. I've always been treated fairly, held to the same standards, never felt like I was an outsider, and I've always loved this community that was so tight-knit and always had your back. Granted, when I first got in, which was shortly after the fighter pilot ban got uh, lifted in 1993, I heard the comments, you're only here because you're a girl, girls don't belong, you know, we don't want you here because you're a girl. It never really bothered me because I knew it wasn't true of why I was there. When I first got to one of my first fighter squadrons, somebody came up to me and told me, you don't belong. So I smiled and ignored him and went on um, with my life and my job. And then fast forward about a year and a half later, uh, he came up to me and he told me he was wrong. He was like, I'm wrong. You do belong here. So first, for a fighter pilot to come and tell you they're wrong, that's a big deal. Um, so that was the first thing. I was like, hey, thanks. That's awesome. Um, but the second was, you know, it kind of validated my measure of my worth isn't my gender, it's my performance. And I think that's what he saw. And I think that was a great thing. 
So now let's fast forward to jink number two for me. Best jink of all time, I will say. I became a single mom. So we're gonna come back to that jink and I'm gonna fast forward to jink number three for a minute. So jink number three, um, can't be a single mom squadron commander. I was told when I was a lieutenant colonel, somebody in my leadership chain told me I'd never be a squadron commander as a single mom. And I thought, huh, have you ever said that to a guy before? So I kind of sat there, I went home, I called one of my best friends, also a f fighter pilot, and uh, she listened, you know, uh, that's what friends are for, right? They listen, they're good friends, they get mad with you, they're your sounding board, and then they're there when you press out. So I didn't let that deter me. Luckily for me, I don't like being told I can't do something. So I was like, hey, I can be a mom, I can be a pilot, and I can be an Air Force leader. So while it wasn't always easy, and there's a ton of juggling that I'll talk about in a minute, I went on to be a single mom squadron commander, group commander, nav commander, or a, a wing commander, and a deputy combatant command J3, all as a single mom. So it's definitely doable. Uh, <laughs> um, so that just kind of solidified to me that you're the only person that could set your limits. Nobody else can tell you what you can or can't do. That's all up to you. So the other thing I learned in my leadership journey is you've got to get out of your comfort zone. I, like I said, fighter kind of, fighters were my world. So my jink number four was getting out of my uh, comfort zone. I decided to get off active duty. I went into the MQ-9 world, I went to the Pentagon, and then I went to be a group commander for special operations. None of this was in my wheelhouse at all. So when I was asked to go do it, I was like, sure, absolutely. Remotely pilot airplanes and special ops, not something I knew of, not something I grew up of, not my community. Again, put my head down, kind of pressed out, and then learned a whole lot more. What I learned is there's a lot of, there's a big Air Force and a big Space Force outside of where we are. I've learned the amazing things that our airmen did and the amazing opportunities I had simply because I let myself get out of the comfort zone, which is not easy. Um, we're not good at that, right? We like kind of, hey, I know this and I'm good at this, I'll stay here. One of the best things I ever did was to go to those two communities. All right, now I'm going to go backwards to jink number two, single mom. Um, so I'll say I'm recently married a year and a half ago, but prior to that, I was a single mom in the Air Force for 11 years. Uh, so when I think about resilience, sometimes it's not just about me. It's about more than one person. And in this case, it was about me and my little boy. His name is Tyler. So it's, for me, him and I were the resilience together. So I'm that mom who put her kid in the CDC at six weeks and one day, because that was the earliest you could do it, right? I'm the, I drop him off first. I pick him off last. I was always the person who set the watch at 1745 to make sure I didn't forget my kid um, because I had to go pick him up. When one of my, uh, I had one of the geos I worked for at the time, he's like, why is your watch going off? I was like, so it's I don't forget my son. And he was like, oh my God, go. Um, so, uh, so Tyler, he came with me on TDYs everywhere. He was a drop in at every random CDC across the Air Force on my TDYs. It was normal for him to be under my desk in the, in the squadron, my date for you know, all the mandatory fun events, and he was there with me serving at the D back on holidays. You know, late night command post calls or emergencies, it wasn't new that, hey, Tyler, I gotta go drop you off at a friend's house or a neighbor's house, I gotta go into work, yep. When my wing was deploying and I was like, hey, buddy, we gotta go in at two o'clock in the morning, mommy needs to go see off the squadron, he was like, all right, came down with his blanket and his teddy bear and said, let's go, right? And he sat in the squadron bar while I went and saw the, uh, <laughs> when I went and saw everybody off on the flight line. He also kind of taught me work-life balance. We sit up here as leaders and we always say, hey, you've got to have work-life balance. Um, clearly I didn't, right? I came home one day, I was a group commander, a little six-year-old came up to me and he kept crawling in my bed at night. For those who your parents, you get it, you're like, okay, this has got to stop. Uh, I was like, buddy, you got to stop crawling in my bed at night. And he looked up at me with his little big brown eyes and he's like, well, mommy, it's the only time I see you. He was like, it's either you're always at work or you come home, you're always on your phone or your computer. And I was like, oh, I was like, it was like a dagger to the heart. And uh, so funny enough, I crawled in his bed that night because um, I had like mom guilt. But uh, like he taught me, I was like, man, as a commander, I sit here and I preach and preach and preach about having work-life balance and I don't have it. So he kind of taught me, and I don't like the word balance. I think he, you know, he kind of taught me. It's a blend, right? Sometimes family's going to work, uh, you know, kind of take the priority, and sometimes it's work. But we've got to figure that out, and we've got to be better at it, or we're not going to be sustainable. 
Um, so as we do this, so what I know is our kids see what we do. And then one of the big things, right, like we're all hard on ourselves. We all have a lot of mom and parent guilt going on, right? So sometimes when you hear something, you're like, hey, I must not be doing something completely wrong. Um, he was downstairs with a bunch of his buddies one time and, you know, one of his little buddies bowed up and said, you know, girls can't do that. And, you know, I put my ear to the, the stairs because I wanted to hear the response. And uh, he's like, what are you talking about? He's like, girls can do anything. He's like, my mom's a fighter pilot. No, I was like, yes. I was like, that's awesome. So sometimes we struggle, but right, I think what we see is our kids recognize that service is important, sacrifices are a part of life, and women can do really anything they want. You're gonna hear a lot of stories out of us today, and we all have a different story, and I think that's important, right, to share our stories, because somebody out there is gonna to relate to my story, and I'm gonna to relate to somebody else's, and all of you will relate to a different story, and I think that's important, because not one story is gonna be the same. Uh, I'll be honest, I've never been a fan of being up here and talking about myself. I, I find it hard. Um, I've never been a fan of being pointed out, hey, first female, you know, X, Y, or Z to hold this position or this job. Uh, I've never been a fan of it. Um, and I think it's because, I know I'm not here because of my gender, I got here because of my performance. But I think as I've gotten older and hopefully a little bit wiser, I've realized the importance to it, right? I know it's important for a little girl or boy to see me take off my helmet and see that, oh, I'm a girl flying a fighter, I can do that. Or sitting up on a stage and saying, hey, she's a NAF commander, I can do that too. We need to see who we want to be and I think that's important um, for us to do that. And I think for all of you out there, you know, we need all of you. We need your talents and your leadership. We all need to know our worth and our value. Our Air Force and our Space Force need you and what you're gonna bring today into the future. So I just wanna say thanks, honored to be here, looking forward to the conversations all day, and thanks for having me. Thanks, Chief Dawson. It's an honor to be among these great and inspiring women here today. As Ms. Reed said yesterday, um, each of us has a unique story, but many of us don't think our story matters. Well, I resemble that remark. As she encouraged us all to share our stories, I hope that you will be empowered to be bold and brave and let others learn what has made you resilient too. Resiliency is not something I've consciously thought about, Instead, I think of it more of a mindset or an attitude. It's the grit that helps you withstand, push through, and recover from difficulties. It's who you are. Many people draw from different sources to develop their resiliency. What makes me resilient is my faith. It is my constant source of inspiration and hope. It has enabled me to persevere during challenging events and maintain an outward calmness despite the inner turmoil, fear, insecurity, indecision, discrimination, expectation, and failure. Many of us have experienced some or all of these. Some of the inspiration, inspirational biblical references that demonstrate resilience that I see are men like Job who lost everything and Moses, who led his people through the wilderness, complaining the whole time. Sounds like my time as squadron commander. <laughs> I'm equally inspired by strong and faithful women, such as Ruth, who lost her husband and left her home, and Esther, who risked her life for her people. These accounts inspire me because each person demonstrated resilience. Even in the face of adversity, they found strength and courage to overcome, and we can do the same. On my bathroom mirror, I have a written encouragement from Philippians 4.13, which says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I also find encouragement from Joshua 1.9, which I had on a post-it note on my computer the whole time I was wing commander. It says, be bold and courageous, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And I definitely needed that as wing commander. My faith is my why, why I don't let things bother me too much, and why I choose to stay in the fight. I want to make a difference. I want to inspire others to accomplish their goals and be the best version of themselves. I attribute my success ultimately to God, who I believe orchestrated the event, but also to my dad. His advice, and now my advice to all of you, 
is to take advantage of every opportunity. Do the best job you can at whatever you're doing and have a positive attitude. These words of wisdom have lived in my heart and mind throughout my 26 year career. I was the first female wing commander in the Georgia Air National Guard, and now I'm the first female one star in the Georgia Air National Guard. <laughs> like you said, <I'm laughs> but did I do anything different or special than anyone else? No, I did my job, I did it well, and I had a positive attitude. And I accepted challenging assignments. In reference to General C.Q. Brown's quote, I made sure I was dressed when the opportunity knocked. It's often difficult to recall major events that impact resiliency when you see yourself simply as someone who only did what was asked and sometimes did what was needed, as General Miller said yesterday. However, these three events um, I will discuss shaped my resilient mindset. When I was a new lieutenant, there was a female lieutenant colonel who was the squadron director of operations. I had played collegiate golf and Air Force golf, so I was asked to play on the unit's intramural team. I had a good work ethic and only played golf after work or during the intramural games and was well regarded by all, so I thought. At this time, probably 2003, 2004 timeframe, there weren't many female leaders in ops. I was at the J-STARS unit at Robbins Air Force Base on active duty at that time. One day I was walking in the hallway near her office I heard someone ask her if she had seen me. Her response shaped the rest of my career. She said, oh, she's probably playing golf. She's always doing something. To this day, I have no idea why she said that or even if she meant it the way that I took it. But I realized that if she had that perception of me, then others probably did also. And I did not want to be perceived as a slacker. So I quit playing golf shortly thereafter. Her comment motivated me to excel. One definition of resilience is bouncing back or coming back better or stronger than before. That's what I did. I focused on work and serving as a great air battle manager and a great CGO, no longer as a great golfer. The second event that I believe gave me a resilient mindset was at SEER training. Lieutenant Colonel Winkles mentioned it yesterday. It's a survival school designed to train certain career fields on how to survive if your aircraft crashes or lands in enemy territory. When I went through training in Washington State, there was eight feet of snow. I had never seen anything like that, nor had I ever a need to know what snowshoes were. As we navigated through the woods on snowshoes carrying a 90-pound ruck, I was challenged to say the least. My motivation was only to finish the training. If you washed out, you just came back later to endure the same grueling training or you were reclassed into a different career field. I was always in the back of the line of my classmates, uh, classmates, probably 13 of us, but very quickly the instructor saw that two men needed to be behind me because when I fell, which was often, I could not get myself up with that pack on my back. The two men behind me had to grab my pack and pull me straight up and back onto my feet, onto my snowshoes. The only reason I'm here today is because of those two Army guys who were behind me, who picked me up every single time I fell. Building strong relationships physically can help you uh, with the needed support and guide you during good times and bad times. This brings me to the third event, COVID. COVID challenged every daily norm. JSTARS was a high demand asset in theater stationed out of Robbins Air Force Base. And we had a regular rotation of aircraft and people to two and sometimes three separate theaters simultaneously. We had a rotation scheduled to go on March 24th, 2020, but the SecDef stop order dropped that day. No one knew what to do except the obvious, stop. But we couldn't do that. We had a deployment order and lives depended on our going, not stopping. So as wing commander, I made a phone call, and within hours, the rotation was a go. Although that was a success, the ongoing three-year COVID-19 event was very challenging. It was awesome in that we experienced in the Guard both our federal mission and state missions simultaneously at unprecedented levels. 
the Georgia National Guard, both Army and Air, began to bring awareness back about the Guard. They were in every major city and town in Georgia, providing shots, support, working in hospitals, transporting shots and equipment, and cleaning all nursing homes and assisted living facilities in the entire state. It was a proud time for the Guard. If you weren't deployed, then you were somehow involved in the domestic crisis. The COVID timeframe showed me that being adaptable during challenges and having a sense of purpose are keys to enduring, overcoming, and thriving. The only constant in life is change, and being resilient means being adaptable. You've all heard that flexibility is the key to air power. Flexibility or being adaptable is key in everything, air power, space power, ops, and event planning. Rarely do plans get executed fully in the way that they are planned. Something invariably goes wrong. Sometimes the unforeseen becomes seen. So resilient or adaptable leaders find new ways to reach their goals when obstacles or challenges get in the way. What does this mean for us today? It means that resiliency is not just about enduring, it's about thriving. It's about understanding that while we cannot control every circumstance, we can control our response to those circumstances. It's about having faith that there is a bigger picture, a higher purpose, and a divine orchestration at work even when we can't see it. It's about taking the challenges, the setbacks, and the failures, and using them as stepping stones to build a stronger, more determined version of yourself. Your story, your resilience, it matters because it's a testament to your character and a beacon of hope to others. Sharing your story isn't just about recounting events. It's about showing that it's possible to rise above adversity. It's about inspiring others to believe that they too can navigate through their challenges and emerge stronger. So I encourage each of you as you leave here today to reflect on your own experiences of resilience. Think about those moments when you were down, but not out. When you could have given up, but chose to push through. And then share those stories. You never know who might be listening, who might be inspired, who might be empowered by your words and your story to share their own story and continue the cycle of resilience and hope. One of my favorite inspirations is Jeremiah 29 11, which says, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. This is my hope for you all, that you find what inspires you and you achieve great things. Thank you for allowing me to share my story with you today. Let us all be resilient, adaptable, and full of hope as we continue to make a difference in our own lives and the lives of others. Thank you. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm completely inspired so far. Um, I will try to continue the momentum. <laughs> Humbled to be able uh, to be here with all of you today. Grateful uh, to share the time. Uh, it's an opportunity that uh, I think a lot of us take for granted uh, and we need to make the time to do things like this. You know, the first job of a leader is to grow more leaders. And what I found through conversation is that the term leader can be intimidating for some. Mm -hmm. You know, when I join the service or I'm coming into a new career field, uh, I don't know what I'm doing, so how am I expected to lead others? But really what that means is we need you to be a problem solver. We need you to lean in, not be afraid to fail. And if you're going to fail, fail forward. So when you think about leader, you think about problem solvers. And our job here, we have a room full of leaders slash problem solvers that are lethal in what they do. Uh, success versus failures. Uh, I would offer to you that winning doesn't suck. And if we could win every day, all day, uh, we would be uh, much happier for it. But that's not how it rolls. And we learn more from our failures than our successes and coming together to share those stories of uncertainty, of a misstep, is valuable. And, and I think the, the thread that I'm hearing so far this morning is about sharing stories. Um, 
relationships. You might have heard that it's uh, all about relationships, or just it's not just about it. It is all about it. You are building relationships by being here in this room that we can't see you because you all might be sleeping right now. Um, <laughs> but being together to share a laugh, uh, to share a story, um, to pass a phone number, um, connect later. It is all about relationships. So it's great to be here with you today. Um, I'm going to try, as I thought about what to share with you, to drop some knowledge bombs uh, mm -hmm. in, in my journey of resilience. Uh, I will attempt to uh, share a, a few of my threads uh, that I have uh, found um, have led me through my entire 32-year career. Uh, and then I'll finish with my story of un unintended impact. Uh, so I enlisted at 18 years old. I came in and I was a SEER specialist. I was not your SEER specialist, <laughs> but I do know the snowshoes. I do know the packs. Uh, and I grew up in New York. I knew nothing about SEER, but I did know I was going to answer a call and I was going to serve. I did know that the Air Force had some pretty incredible training and they could train me on how to teach others to return with honor. And I wasn't successful. I did not know what I was doing, but I didn't say two words. I never said I quit. You could fail me all day long, but I would get right back up, or a teammate would pick me up by the scruff of my neck and we would move out. I never said I quit. And when I failed, I failed forward and I took the next step. Not always easy, but continue. And I will tell you, in that journey, my first supervisor said to me, I never had a woman work for me, I don't know how to deal with you, and I don't want to learn. So at 18 years old, what do you do with that? Well. You have a teammate that picks you up by the scruff of the neck and shows you the way. Uh, and I realized in that moment that it did not matter what I said, that actions were going to have to speak for me. And actions speak louder than words. And that has been the bedrock of my entire career. So although that uh, encounter was terrible, uh, it was foundational in who I became as an Air Force leader slash problem solver. Because I showed up, I leaned in, and I let, I let my actions speak for me. And then I encouraged others to do the same. Even though it may not have been to standard because I was learning, or, or it wasn't as good as somebody else, I still gave it my all. I worked on my degree, went to officer training school, and then looked for the next challenge. And the next challenge was coming to Air Force Special Operations. And I got my dream. I ended up in the AC-130 gunship, know nothing about flying. So you took a professional camper and then you put them in aviation training. Um, but then again, a shout out to the training. They can train us to do incredible things. I wasn't the best. I wasn't the fastest. Uh, but I never said the words, I quit. And I showed up in Air Force Special Operations uh, as an underrepresented group. We did not have a lot of women there. Uh, but it didn't matter. Uh, I had self-doubt. Imposter syndrome, right? It's not a woman thing. This is a human condition. We do not feel that we are equipped to do things, and sometimes we can be our own worst enemies. But you take that next step, and you move forward. So that first lesson as a young airman into my years as an officer in Air Force Special Operations, uh, whether it was with my Air Force Special Operations teammates or it was my joint teammates around the world, it did not matter whether it was Afghanistan or Iraq or Syria or Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia, Japan, Australia, Africa, South or Central America, you show up and you let your actions speak for you and they'll respect you for it. Now, you own your reputation. You define that. You wear a lot of things on your uniform. You wear your name. So what does that, what do you want that to represent? You wear your service. You might wear your unit. You wear your flag. You represent our country. You get to. There's a, uh, something I always fall back to, and it's getting to versus having to. So we have to do a lot of things. We have to wear our uniform a certain way. We have to show up for work certain hours. We have to do certain things by technical orders in our line of work. And there are days uh, where you might not really want to. You have to pay the bills. You have to feed the kids. You have to 
put the sleeping bag under the desk so the kid's comfortable playing with the, with the matchbox cars and the dinosaurs so you can, get, so you can get the job done. Um, you have to do a lot of things, but in those moments where you feel like you're kicking rocks and you're exhausted or you're not good enough, if you take the word have and you toss it aside and you put the word get, it's a totally different perspective. I get to get up on my own two feet and go to work today. Not everybody gets to. I get to wear that flag on my shoulder and show up and represent the values that we hold so dear. Not everybody gets to. So think about it that way. It's a totally different perspective. And there are days where I wake up and I'm like, ugh, I have to. And then I'll roll to the front gate and there's a defender smiling at me. Good morning, ma'am. And I realize I get to. Uh, so it's, it, it takes good teammates. Um, be really good at your job, right? I don't care how, uh, how tall you are, how short you are, what your color is, what your gender is. If you're really good at your job, we want you on that team. So show up and encourage others again to do the same. Humble, credible, and approachable are uh, cornerstones. Uh, always be humble. Let your actions speak for you. Never forget where you've come from, whether you came from uh, a home where there wasn't food in your pantry, in your cupboards, uh, whether you came from a home that had everything, uh, whether you had struggles, whether you had successes. Always remain, hum remain humble. Credible, work every day for your credibility. And we talked about that. You've heard it um, uh, from our first two rock stars and you hear it from myself. People want to feel a part of a team. They want to feel valued, they want to be seen, and they want to be heard. And sometimes it's a little bit harder to tie them into the mission because it's not visible. Generating an aircraft on the, as a maintainer on the line is visible. Flying the aircraft and destroying the enemy is visible. But sometimes the support structures, the logistical tail, our medical piece, making sure our people are mentally, spiritually, physically fit to fight isn't so visible. So you need to lean in to make sure that our people understand they're tied to the mission so they have sense of mission, sense of purpose. Lead with intent. Lean in, know what you want to do, and go get after it. So I said I was going to uh, tie up uh, with my story of unintended impact. Uh, much like my teammates here on the t at the table, I don't like to talk about myself. I will talk all day long about all of you. And that's what brings us joy. That's what, where I fill my cup, is with all of you. And it took me decades to be comfortable sharing stories about myself because I just wanted to do my job. And I was being called out in this story because I was different and I didn't value it. But over time, in conferences like just like this, in meetings and, and uh, just offhanded conversations, you all have empowered me to share my story. So thank you for that. Thank you for giving me the courage over the years to share my successes, but more importantly, my failures. And this one's a little bit of a success. So you heard it yesterday. I wasn't here because I was delayed flying out here, but I heard General Richardson might have teed it up. Um, you wouldn't know me uh, out of uniform. I'm in my ball cap and my hoodie, but uh, some might call me the angel of death. And he, so there I was. <laughs> We go back to 2001, and I was a young lieutenant, part of the 16th Special Operations Squadron, the AC-130 Spectre gunship out of Hurlburt Field. And those airplanes hit, that, hit those towers, and we knew, uh, we knew we were going to war. What that looked like, we did not know. So we eventually got our airplanes over to Uzbekistan, country to the north of Afghanistan, and within 12 hours, because in the Air Force you have to have 12 hours of crew rest, uh, so in t 12 hours later, from the time we put those airplanes on the ground, we were brought into a, a tent and we were given a call sign, a frequency, and a grid, a location of the team. And this team happened to be Operational Detachment Alpha 595, the horse soldiers, if you've seen the movie 12 Strong, uh, co-located with General Dostum, who at the time was an Afghan warlord with the Northern Alliance in Northern Afghanistan. And our mission, my mission as a navigator on the gunship, is to tell the pilots where to go, get from point A to point B, but also all the tactical communications from that aircraft down to the ground. In fact, the usually the communications from the aircraft to the other aircraft in the stack on that particular mission. So we arrive on station and our, and our primary job is to identify the friendlies, which we do. Then we identify the enemy. And at that time, in 2001 in November, it was dark. This, the country was real dark. And anybody that was out at night was, were usually adult males up to no good. So when we were looking for our, uh, our target sets, we were looking for any tanks, any multiple rocket launcher systems, 
uh, we found a, uh, a vehicle headed towards a friendly location uh, and we were cleared to engage. So as we're communicating on SATCOM, it's my voice painting the picture to our teammates on the ground. Remember, 2001, we had no air-to-ground video feed like we do today. So it was through clear, concise communication and words that I was painting the picture for them and what, what was actually, uh, what was on the ground. So this is a building uh, with uh, multiple adult males, multiple vehicles, and the, and the one vehicle was approaching and we were cleared hot. In that aircraft was full of experience. You had a seasoned aircraft commander. You had a very young co-pilot. You had a seasoned fire control officer, Lieutenant Colonel Old Krusty type. You had a young lieutenant um, next, to, next to him. And, and the, gunner, the gun crew was the same way. Seniors and juniors, our sensor operators, the same way. So even back then, they knew it was important to grow experience. So when we were cleared hot, I looked over at our fire control, control officer. I said, Game on. I couldn't tell you what I had for dinner last night, but I remember <laughs> that moment. Because that's what we had trained for. And I'm from New York. So being able uh, to be a part of that mission, to make sure that they never came back to our soil to do something like that again, um, I get the chills just thinking about it. So we engage. Uh, we engage. We shot 400 rounds of 40 millimeter and 100 rounds of 105 on the enemy that night. And we were Winchester. Yes. Booyah. <laughs> so, I will tell you the story evolves like this. As we're communicating and engaging the enemy, General Dostum hears my voice on the radio. And he looks at our American part, our American teammates, and he said, is that, is that a woman? And, and our teammate says, you know, as a matter of fact, it is. And General Dostum says, America is so determined. They bring their women to kill Taliban. So, Remember the cultural aspect of the, the empowerment or lack of women in Afghanistan during that time. He was, he laughed. He could not believe that we were so determined. So he gets on his walkie talkie and calls the enemy that we're engaging and says, you are so pathetic. American women are killing you. You need to surrender to us now. This is happening while we're engaging. We were also using a laser pointer. We call it an islet. It's a high-powered laser pointer that's on board the aircraft, really for sorting and tracking the enemy and where they're moving. Under night vision goggles, you can see this from the sky. General Dostum had a pair of night vision goggles. He sees this laser, and he looks at our American teammates, and he says, is that, is that a death ray? <laughs> and they look at each other, and they're like, as a matter of fact, it is. So they believe this laser would point to the ground and blow things up, which essentially it was our 105s and our 40 millimeters. So he gets back on his walkie-talkie and says, you need to surrender to me now. And he keys the mic while I'm talking. So the enemy can hear my voice over the radio. He says, the angel of death is raining death, on destru death and destruction on you. Surrender to me now. We were able to remove hundreds of enemy personnel that night. And the next morning, uh, Hundreds more surrendered to General Dostum for what the crew of the AC-130s were able to do for the teams on the ground. I just happened to be the voice. And that was unique in itself because we didn't have a lot of women in the country speaking on satellite communications, but specifically on, in the AC-130. But the story doesn't stop there. So two weeks later, General Dostum, in November of 2001, goes to a burqa unveiling ceremony in an Afghan village filled, filled with Afghan women and children. And he tells the story how America allows their women to fly on war planes. And he says, if you are determined, you will one day too have those freedoms. So continue to fight against the Taliban and Al Qaeda. He then tells his story to his family over the years. For circa 2011, I was able to meet General Dostum's son in New York City at Ground Zero, and he shared that his father would tell the stories of what America allows their women to do. I met Afghan women over the years who had also heard that story, or a version of it, because it definitely is, has changed over time. <laughs> Unintended impact. I just wanted to do my job. I just wanted to protect our friendlies on the ground. I wanted to be part of something bigger than myself. I did not want to be called out for being a woman. I wanted to be called out because I was good. I was an asset and not a liability. That is no different than any single one of you. 
but the impact I was able to have to inspire is not lost on me, but took me many years to wrap my arms around and share. So did the thread of sharing your story. People need to hear it. You all have walked a journey unlike anybody else in this room. Share it. Share your success. Share your failures. We learn more from our failures than our wins. Thank you for being incredible teammates. Thank you for letting me go to go over time, but share that story. I and we are a part of our heritage, and I am proud to have served side by side with every single one of you over the years. May God bless all of you. May God bless this great nation. Thank you. Like I need to get autographs from the ladies. <laughs> that was an incredible story. Thank you for sharing, and all of you for sharing your stories. Um, I want to thank the host for putting on this event. Um, this is an incredible um, event so far. Um, a few of us were here yesterday and able to uh, sit in with you and hear your questions and see our speakers' comments and. Uh, uh, you know, most of us entered the service at a time where an event like this would never have happened, um, and these conversations wouldn't have had a venue. So, really appreciate the team from SAFMR that put this to get, excuse me, together. Get choked up thinking about how different it is sometimes. Um, really, an incredible event. Um, as far as resiliency, like like most of the other ladies, you know, I can't pinpoint a single event in my career. Uh, resiliency for me is just a, a way of life, a mindset, as what is alluded to earlier, um, a way of approaching the day-to-day -day and bouncing back and pivoting in the face of what you see and encounter along the way. Um, I do want to acknowledge, and I have some visuals to augment, um, that none of us would be here but for some paths that were blazed before us. For me in particular, if we could go to the first slide. Um, most folks um, have seen this picture. Um, these ladies, um, that's me, the one uh, brunette there, um, in Alaska on my first fighter assignment. Um, and um, the other ladies with me, both uh, F-15 uh, lady fighter pilots and uh, hardened killers, um, they uh, were on their second assignment in fighters by the time um, I arrived. Um, I was not in the first wave of women that went into combat aviation in the Air Force, um, but I was one of the first few cohorts that went straight through, so no assignments before, um, right into the pipeline, right into transition training in a fighter, and right into my first assignment. And I can tell you that having uh, these ladies already uh, in the pipeline present, experienced, um, senior captains and young field grade officers there made the path much easier uh, for me despite the challenges that I would eventually face. Um, and I want to acknowledge how important it was that we had um, those women before us. Um, I look at that picture um, taken 10 years after I entered the service. Um, and I think about um, the women in flight test. I have some time uh, in flight test. and. Um, I think about folks like 80 years ago this October, Ann Baumgartner was America's first fighter jet lady pilot uh, flying the YB-59 um, out of right field at a time where women weren't even allowed to officially be um, in the military service. I think about folks like General Burt mentioned who were inspiration to me to even end up in this situation, um, like uh, Sally Ride, the first American woman in space. And um, astronaut Eileen Collins, a fellow uh, rural Washington small town girl um, who inspired me to pursue my dreams and pursue engineering, go to the Air Force Academy, and eventually become a, a, a pilot. I also think about folks that immediately before we had the opportunity to transition into some of the things we did, um, were kicking the door open for women to fly in combat aviation. I think of all the ladies, the class of 80 from the Academy, um, all the ladies that were flying as navigators and as pilots in our non-tactical aircraft um, who, who for years were demonstrating exactly what Colonel Black said. Um, they were just doing their job. They were being incredible. They were showing up. They were leaning into the opportunities they had, and they were continuing to beat the drum that there are more barriers that needed to be broken down. 
I think about folks like uh, uh, retired Colonel um, and retired senior executive, Dr. Eileen Bjorkman, who was our test uh, director at the Air Force Test Center at Edwards. She was a flight test engineer um, in the early days before women were technically allowed to be fighter pilots. Um, and yet those women in flight tests did an incredible amount of building the credibility necessary for us to even go to fighters because as testers, they were allowed to fly them and test. And they were the first ones that broke that barrier open. I think about folks like um, uh, Colonel uh, Chandra Kans Beckman, um, now deceased, and, and on the far left there, Colonel um, Andrea Gunna Meisner, um, who uh, really were great mentors and examples to me, having gone just before me into some of these career fields. Uh, I think of folks like uh, uh, General Sabrick will know, uh, Colonel Shock and Mock May in the Viper community, the first dual mill, dual fighter pilot couple that my spouse and I um, had a chance to be mentored by. Um, and I think about folks like uh, my parents and grandparents who, uh, you know, they could not have imagined from where we came from in those homes without food in the pantry, in some cases, um, where I would end up and our family would end up. So um, I've been incredibly blessed with opportunities, as many of us have. Um, and despite being acknowledged as the first for something, um, a lot of that is luck and timing. And I would not uh, be where I am today without the folks who blazed the trail and allowed a brand new junior officer to show up and not be the only woman in a fighter squadron the first time I showed up, and that was a big deal at that time. Um, most of you are familiar, um, not because it's something I'm comfortable talking about, but because it was very uh, uh, notable at the time, almost uh, 16 years ago now, um, on the next slide, I, I had the opportunity, based on what we were doing in our Air Force, to transition uh, to fly the F-22 Raptor in operational assignments. Um, this was a big deal. I was a junior officer, just excited to get to fly some really cool technology. Um, and um, uh, it was a big deal at the time in a way that I was not used to, maybe akin to the reaction and the unintended impact that Colonel Black mentioned. Um, there was a lot that went into getting me to this moment and a lot of people that supported that um, and a lot of things along the way that were barriers that were invisible uh, to many in, in leadership and it took an incredible amount of resilience to get to this place. Um, I think as some of the other ladies have shared, um, you know, there wasn't a, a training program I went to to include day one at the Air Force Academy where people weren't questioning uh, if I had a right to be there um, based on my gender. Um, but at the same time, I got to go to the best uh, undergraduate engineering school in the country, in my opinion, the, the road up the hill at the Air Force Academy. Uh, I had hundreds of aerobatic sorties um, as an aviator in the Air Force, as a cadet air, uh, soaring instructor before I ever set, um, set foot at Air Force pilot training. Um, and I had had incredible opportunities to intern at places like NASA, to travel to the Columbian Air Force Academy at a time when they were not allowing their women to go to pilot training and fly aerobatic gliders for them and in front of them to demonstrate that it was indeed a possibility. Um, and those opportunities existed because the women before me um, and the men that were in leadership advocated for what we could do that we were ready, that we were resilient, and that we could be combat capable uh, just as well as anyone else. So for me, when I think about resilience, um, I want to acknowledge first that it took a lot of work by a lot of people to get the small town girl from Washington to this situation. And we have come a long, long way since Ann Baumgartner flew in her fighter jet 80 years ago this October. Um, my advice, based on my experience, um, is similar to what was passed here, um, but I think for the younger generation, it's important to realize that there are barriers that you will not be able to overcome um, in your tenure and lifetime. And um, my approach to dealing with them is fairly straightforward. The very first thing we can do, as General Burt said, to be resilient, ready, and combat credible now is you gotta say what you see. I will say in my junior years in the service, um, I was very silent, as we are sometimes conditioned to be, 
about the barriers to me being as ready and combat credible as I could be. And as I got more senior, particularly when I arrived in this aircraft, um, I felt that there was a need to speak out, um, and so I did. Um, there are a lot of issues that still remain that it's our responsibility to speak out about, and they specifically have to do with making us ready and combat credible. Um, I think it's very relevant today. Um, so for everyone in the room that's encountering barriers, male or female, no matter what your career field is, it's important that you speak out. Things like, hey, the flight equipment does not fit my body. The ejection system isn't making me survivable, as it is peers that might be shaped differently. The um, systems for in-flight relief to cross the Pacific Ocean aren't <laughs> suitable yet, you know, for, for what I need to be combat credible to do my mission. This applies to every career field. And uh, for me at this point, um, it was really important that folks were speaking out. Some of the ladies in that first picture had done a great job of speaking out to advocate so that the barriers I encountered by the time I got here were a lot less, but they were still there. So the way I dealt, dealt with that was to tell my leadership, sir or ma'am, this equipment doesn't fit, I need your help. The thing is, if you don't, point out the barriers to being ready and combat credible in your career field, whether it's doctrine, organization, training, material, leadership and personnel, policy, um, et cetera. Um, people assume that everything's okay. It's really important that we speak out and just identify the barrier, even if there's nothing that can be done about it at that time. Um, it documents the disconnect and allows our leaders and our system the opportunity to close the gaps. Um, and that was how, as a more junior officer, I, I tackled the situation. The second point about resiliency, um, and I have a few more pictures here to show, is, um, um, and I few, think a few others mentioned this, uh, which is, uh, you know, in, in flying, we talk about maneuvering in relation to the bandit. So, you know, you, you see, you decide, you act, right? So you got to maneuver in relation to the, the situations you encounter. You got to maneuver in relation to the barriers that may stop you. Um, and the biggest part for me of my resiliency story was maneuvering in relation to the barriers associated with uh, my unique journey as a fighter pilot married to another fighter pilot in the service, and uh, especially once I became a parent uh, while trying to maintain a combat arms, two, two combat arms careers. Um, this changed things a lot for us, just to share a couple other pictures. Um, on the next slide, um, you know, it's. I got to do some pretty cool things, even while all of those things were happening. I got to take a fighter jet home to my home state of Alaska and Boeing Field and show it to all the incredible people that built that aircraft out of Boeing and fabricated some of the LO materials and shapes. Um, on the next slide, I got to the opportunity to meet the WASP. This is a Washington State WASP Dorothy Olson um, and escort several of them to their Congressional Gold Medal ceremony. Um, thanks to the work of Colonel Fifi Malakowski, who was, she was a staffer, worked to acknowledge the service of those who had come before us. Um, I also got to do some other pretty cool things to pay it forward. On the next slide, you'll see there's, um, this is during some time in Iraq, these are our interpreters. Um, we got to host a decent amount of events to acknowledge the Iraqi women and what they were doing to bring peace and to restore the stability of their country. Um, I also had the opportunity to um, be part of the Women, Peace, and Security program overseas and other places at the combatant commands. So in the next slide, you'll just see a few pictures associated with some of the things we did overseas. I got to take some fighter jets out to the Pacific and land in Korea at a time during some stability challenges on the Korean Peninsula, um, and then got to spend some time on the next slide um, being with our allies and partners in the Pacific and reassuring them. Um, this is at the Australian Defense Force Academy at a time where they were sending their first ladies into Hornet training. Um, they weren't sure how they were going to integrate and, and make things uh, successful, and we were invited to come talk about the experiences we had. Um, the officer, Army officer um, to the left there, were standing with their chief of the Air Force. Um, she's a combat helicopter pilot, also married to a combat helicopter pilot in the Army. Had some incredible stories and also a parent to three kids. Um, just incredible folks that you get to cross paths with. All of this, um, these things were happening at a time sort of after I encountered some major resilience <clears throat> barriers associated with being a working parent, 
um, and part of a dual fighter pilot couple, a, a situation I think a lot of folks in the service today encounter. Um, you know, the workforce has really changed since we entered service uh, nearly uh, 30 years ago. You know, most of our professionals, um, at least up, up north where I am, you know, the, the colonels, the chiefs, and everybody down below is dual professional families one way or another, and a lot of them with young kids. Um, and that really uh, put a lot of barriers to service for me um, when I was junior in my career. Um, in particular, after squadron command, I had two children in squadron command. Um, it was a great experience. I flew in between. Um, but an outplacement for us from the Air Force was, you know, us on other side, opposite sides of the planet. And you know, sort of the, the younger kid, the baby and the toddler were on their own in that situation. Um, so I had to make a pivot and maneuver in relation to the situation. I transitioned to the reserve component at that time so that we could at least for, you know, eight to nine months a year keep our household intact. And yet, we still pay it forward. Um, so my third uh, kind of point about resilience in, in the face of barriers, which we will all face, is to can take action. Take action to still make it better. Take action to change um, advocate for changes to policy based on data and impact, um, and take action to uh, build the life of your dreams in relation to what your opportunities are, and to thank those that have made it possible, including these incredible ladies sitting to my right at the table. Um, I have a few more slides to share, and then we're really excited to take some of your questions. Um, on the next slide, um, I forgot to mention this one. This was when the Japanese Air Force was sending its first women through uh, F-15 training in the JAZZ staff, and uh, we got a chance to meet with their leadership and, and coach them on some pointers to successful integration. On the next slide, you'll see some, um, some great uh, opportunities. Um, this is a nod to my, my colleagues in the test community at Edwards, you know, our, one of our first test articles of the Raptor, the opportunity to lead the incredible men and women of uh, our 412th Ops group. Uh, down at Edwards, um, the, the second largest OG in the Air Force and our most complex and diverse aircraft portfolio. It was a dream come true for a small town girl interested in, uh, you know, flying in the, amongst the stars at some point and uh, just incredible things because of the paths that have been blazed and the barriers that have been overcome before each of us arrived in the service. And we hope that it's better for each of you because of the trails that we have walked uh, just a few decades ahead. Um, I'll wrap by saying that uh, my uh, resiliency experience would not be possible without support of some key people in my life. Um, a few slides here just to acknowledge them. Um, next slide, please. All right, this is, uh, this is the future. So I, I'm up in Alaska. This is uh, Dizzy. She is our uh, newest and youngest uh, F-22 pilot up uh, in one of the Raptor squadrons up north. Um, and the opportunity to be able to, to mentor her and lift her up and make the path a little easier for her um, is part of what inspires us. Next slide. All right, so I talked about what it's like, so I have to acknowledge that part of my resiliency journey has been being part of a dual male couple. I've, this, uh, this officer and I met in 1997 in a multivariable calculus class up the hill at the academy. <laughs> uh, we were Air Force uh, aviators and aerobatic demonstration pilots at the academy long before we flew fighters. Um, so it's, you know, I'm really blessed that we have been able to have at least uh, four assignments in 24 years together. <laughs> um, and uh, it's been a great journey. Um, this would not have been possible without folks that have blazed the path for us. Um, and I want to encourage all of you that despite the barriers, um, there is a way to say what you see to make it better right now where you're serving and with whom you're serving, to maneuver in relation to the barriers that you can't overcome and still have a great career, and then to pay it forward and do work when you're at the positions to do so, like at the Pentagon doing policy work, to help make the path better, easier, and more ready, resilient, and combat credible for those that come after us. Um, so this is a very old picture. I know we look still very gorgeous, but <laughs> yes. So from this, we just click through quickly so we can take your questions. We got to, I volunteered for an all expenses paid tour to Mesopotamia so we could have some time together back in the 2000s. Got to go to war together. That's General Lorenz from the Academy for those that remember him, a uh, big inspiration to us, and I got to command the squadron he graduated from, which was awesome. 
So three of these young folks, those are our three babes, uh, left to right, um, boy, girl, boy, um, lovely young people, definitely a resiliency challenge for all of us that are parents. Um, and yet here, you know, very challenging time. Uh, here are the people that made my life easier. That's my mom. My mom, I feel like she get deployment medals. She's effectively lived in my household for about two to three years since I became a parent. And I want to talk about these two ladies here. So these two ladies are C mighty C-130 combat pilots, and they are also part of dual military, dual aviator couples. That's uh, Colonel Brianna, maiden name Colt Langford, and uh, Colonel retired Sarah Courtney Santoro. Um, you know, sometimes we forget as ladies in the fighter business, for those that have done it, that uh, TAC lift was not fully integrated, certainly soft was not fully integrated. Um, either and uh, these ladies really blazed a trail and no matter where I've been in the world they have made my life easier so I encourage each of you to build that village no matter where it is um, and uh, I've known them since I was 19 years old um, and uh, that's a big part of, of where I am today so here we are the babies made it um, we both got a chance to lead and serve as colonels um, the little guy he's big but he's he's only six so he's a little wild um, and uh, we've had a great opportunity and we're very blessed and we hope to, um, that it's easier for those that have had to blaze the path of dual professional service. Um, we've got an awesome team up in Alaska and um, my spouse is up there in the third wing. If you look behind him, you'll see the Chiefs Miller. So the command chief team is a dual mill. And I know in the audience today, we have Chief Wisner and some of our excellent maintainers um, in the Raptor and other platforms. Uh, from Alaska who are all part of dual military professional couples. Uh, next slide. All right, that's the end. So I'll, I'll close my remarks by saying um, the journey is worth it. It will be hard. <laughs> it's really important for resiliency that you say what you see to make things right where you can right now. If you say nothing, people think there's not a problem. Second, you got to maneuver in relation to what's in front of you. Um, the path will be different than your plan. Um, but you can do it, and the key is to never say, I quit. And finally, um, when you have a chance and you're in positions of leadership or policy making where you can make the path better and remove barriers to service and barriers to readiness, please lean into those opportunities because we're counting on you. And I'm very encouraged by everything that uh, um, I've heard from the ladies on this panel and their example and really encouraged by what each of you will bring to the service and I know we're in good hands. So thank you. I appreciate you. Wow, incredible stories uh, as, a, uh, as an airman, as a father of daughters, thank you. And uh, as, as I'm listening to these stories, uh, I think the best thing to sum this, this up before we go to questions is uh, to our adversaries, buckle up. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> All right, we'll uh, open the floor to questions. Uh, we have an online question I'll start with here first. Uh, this is to Colonel Jameson. What is one unilateral policy decision you would recommend to improve the representation of uniformed women in the air and space forces? Policy. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, I think that um, I, if I could wave a wand, like if I were in a position um, and there would be many leaders and probably legislators involved, but um, if I were in a position to, you know, wake up tomorrow, this is a miracle question, like wake up tomorrow and make it better for everyone, um, I think I would really target um, accessions um, specifically. Um, you know, we've been on this journey for a long time as uh, women uh, serving our nation and fighting uh, not just for our nation, but fighting for a seat at the table, fighting for place in combat arms and um, progression um, everywhere, and not just in uniform, but in the civil service and I would say in public service everywhere um, and in our state and local um, and national governments. And. Um, from a representation standpoint, I think that, uh, I think about this like an engineer a little bit. Every system is perfectly designed to produce the outcome it's currently producing. And we have decades of evidence to suggest that, you know, the changes at the margins don't really substantially increase representation of women in the ranks, even though women are clearly capable and in a country of 350 million people, 
half of which are women, um, there are more than enough able-bodied uh, young people to do every career field we have in our service. So I think for me, um, if I wake up tomorrow, I'd, pr I'd probably be targeting a sessions representative of our population. And I can think of no greater way to honor the class of uh, 80s ladies as we come up on uh, the class of 2030. Let it sink in for a second. Uh, the class of 2030, the 50th class of women to, the, to graduate from the academy will enter the academy two years from now. And they are currently sophomores in high school and they are currently deciding their futures and the admissions and recruiting process for that is already starting right now. Um, and I can think of no better way to honor them to, than to have that class enter as half female. Um, and uh, I think there are plenty of, of women that are ready. Um, we did some studies um, back about recruiting when I, when I worked in the Pentagon and 55% uh, of the 18 to 24 year old young adults in our country that are military propense, medically eligible, and high STEM aptitude for women. Um, I think it's the largest under-recruited talent population. I think we need it to beat China, to beat Russia, and to be credible on the world stage as leading um, with the best talent in the world, and that's probably where I'd target it. Um, but thanks for the miracle question. <laughs> awesome, thank you. And we have a question over here. Hello, ladies. My name is Captain Arius Hassan from the 57th Space Aggressor Squadron. My question is for Colonel Black. Ma'am, thank you for sharing your story. You briefly spoke about imposter syndrome, and space is hard, and orbital warfare is even harder. What advice do you have for those of us who experience imposter syndrome? Great question. Thanks for having the courage to come up to the microphone and ask it. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I mentioned that imposter syndrome is it's not a it's not a male female thing, right? It is just a human condition in not being comfortable in, in your in your space. Uh, whether it's through lack of reps and sets in life because we're young or in a specific job or in the service, uh, right? Because it's not just those of us in uniform, it's our civilian teammates as well. So I, I think combating imposter syndrome is uh, relying on your circle. Right? We all have our tribe. Who's in your tribe and who's in your corner? And being able to be real with those people and have them lift you up. Uh, you're not gonna ask them to lift you up. They will just see that you're facing those challenges and they'll come in from the, from the sides to do so. So I think it's the preparation up. Know, know that it's gonna come, right? You're going to be in a position where you feel like you're an imposter. So how do you prepare for that battle? It's by having good teammates to your left and right and that tribe that you can rely on. And it's confidence. Trust your training, trust your judgment. Trust your spidey senses, right? Your, your experience, good and bad, will give you uh, the, the pinch on the back of your neck, right? To go, this isn't quite right, or I should say something, or maybe I'm not valued, or maybe I'm not ready. And you know what? You might not be. Lean in. Because what's the worst thing can happen? You don't get the right result, but you're gonna learn from it, right? Use your people and use your resources. Uh, I, I am definitely not the smartest person in the room uh, because I don't need to be. We've got all the talent we need right here and know your resources and pull them together to solve that problem. So when you feel like the imposter and you can't solve something or you, can't, you don't think you can deliver the result that you've been asked to, use your resources, sniff out your talent, bring them together for the solution. And I think that gives you the courage to then come back to the table and lean in and then fail forward. Thank you, ma'am. We've got time for one more question. That's a great question. Good morning, ladies. Captain Sarah Rowley, 479 Stuce, NES Pensacola. This is more geared towards uh, Colonel Jameson, but also the entire panel. Uh, you spoke about the multiple barriers you've experienced as female aviators and call to action for change. So my question is, what programs and policies do you believe that still need to be addressed to retain female aviators in the US Air Force? I'll just quickly say that the co-location policy for military couples only applies to the active component. And so for me as a reserve component officer and my husband in the active component, I've still continued to cycle at an active duty pace without the 
uh, joint spouse accommodation. So that's one, th and I think there's a lot of women in dual milk couples that are in those situations. 4,000 cross-component dual milk couples the last time I saw the stats. And um, I think that's a policy gap that could be fixed with the stroke of a pen. That's, uh, that's what I would advise. I think it's really important, the dual, dual professional accommodations, particularly dual mill, and particularly for aviators because of the pace at which we cycle through assignments. Um, I also think that there's an opportunity to continue to remove barriers associated with uh, pregnancy and aviation duty. That's something I worked on at the WIT at the Pentagon. I know they've done great strides moving that forward. Uh, General Goldfein. General Van Ovost, uh, General Kelly, recently retired COMAC, I'd like to acknowledge their leadership on those issues in particular. Uh, there's more to go on those ones and certainly would help to retain our aviators. And then continuum of service opportunities are something that I think all of our service members need, the opportunity to throttle the intensity and duration of their service in order to have that full human lifespan, right? Partner up, maybe have some kids, have a life, uh, while continuing to serve for the long term. And uh, I think those would really help to move the ball forward. And I'll defer to the rest of the panel. Thank you. The, um, it was brought up already, too. And there's so many of you in the room who are working on this between the WIT and the Athena efforts right now, which I think is phenomenal. Um, I feel like I've been talking about peeing in the jet for 28 years. <laughs> and uh, like, I mean, we're finally getting there. But I mean, I'm still flying. And you know, you go and be like, hey, what about this? And you know, we're, we're getting there. It's not fast. But I mean, you're all doing great efforts on it. And I think it, it's moving forward. But it's little stuff, right? Um, one of the, I think the Arc Athena um, stuff last year, I think uh, General Hokinson got up and said, women are not just small men. And I was like, that's great. That is a true statement, right? Like, we are not built the same, you know? We need different gear, right? So there's, a, there's been a huge push, I would say, and uh, there's a lot of great effort going on on that, and we need it to be, right? Because we're not just the men small, right? I mean, we're all shaped differently. And I, I think there's some great efforts going on, and, you know, anything, you know, we all can do to help that is a big thing. But some of that is just getting it through the system and, you know, making sure it's there as we, as we go through this for all of the, everybody that's coming up behind us. I would offer too that it's, it's just, I mean, they, it's not just aviation, right? It's our defenders, it's our maintainers, it's the equipment fit for a body size. We do, there are a lot of small men in our service too, right? So it doesn't always fit a, a you know, six foot tall, 220 pound adult male. So how do, and then how do we partner with industry to get them uh, to provide solutions? So if we look at it internally, if we can, in, uh, if we can inspire them to then contribute back to the military service, because then they're doing something good, we might see we might see impact a little faster than we have. Yeah, and I, th I think General Sabrick brought up a great point. Um, uh, I've received some really good mentorship uh, a long time ago uh, from a wing commander that when you have the chance to touch the future, it's a huge responsibility, and you know, don't screw it up, basically, and. Um, you know, at the time the women were entering the academies in the 70s and into aviation career fields, so navigator training and pilot training in the 70s, decisions were being made about weapon systems that we still fly today. Things like ejection seats, egress systems, the ground equipment, the age equipment, the tooling to do the maintenance. Um, again, I think about all this as an engineer. Um, and I think that when we are designing those systems to be inclusive of the full anthropometric spectrum of our population, um, as opposed to designing around the Gemini and Mercury astronaut bodies <laughs> that were surprisingly five foot nine, plus or minus a few inches and 160 plus or minus a few pounds, that's not inclusive for our whole population. So there's decisions being made now to acquire weapon systems that will affect the next 60 years of uh, service members in aviation, in space, in ground maintenance jobs. Um, and those are the ones that will have the lasting impact and those barriers cannot be easily overcome. It's important that we're accommodating from a design perspective right at the outset um, our weapons of war to be designed around all the bodies in our citizenry um, so that they are, those who are willing are able to serve and be ready and combat credible. This concludes our time here. Uh, thank you to the panelists. I also want to take a moment here to thank the unsung heroes, our American Sign Language interpreters who have been jobbing it the whole time.
For those of you who are uh, interested in continuing this discussion, we will have small group discussions this afternoon, and you'll have an opportunity to engage with the panelists there. Uh, please take a 20-minute uh, break and uh, get back to your seats. We'll start the next panel. Thank you. Chief Master Sergeant Susan Andre, and I will be your moderator for this session. It is my pleasure to introduce Lieutenant Colonel Harley Nefrata from the 17th Training Group at Goodfellow Air Force Base in Texas. He will be helping us to get a better understanding of the biases we have, how to recognize them, and how to overcome them. Sir, the floor is yours. <laughs> Oh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Chief, for that introduction. And, and now's the time I tell you how terrified I am to be standing uh, in front of this room of absolute heroes. I'm not joking. Uh, I do have a couple things in my favor. I'm 5'3", so this podium basically covers me up. Um, my commander is here, and he's always a great source of support, uh, so that certainly calms me. And for reals, like everyone else said, I cannot see you. Um, so <laughs> all good, right? Uh, no, seriously, I'm, I'm humbled to be given uh, the opportunity to spend some time uh, with you. First, I'd ask you to, uh, I want to ask you a favor before we get started, though, and I'd like you to help in solving this puzzle. Next slide, please. Slide. Okay, so a father and son were involved in a car accident in which the father was killed, and the son was critically injured. The father was pronounced dead at the scene of the accident and his body was taken to a local morgue. The son was taken by ambulance to a nearby hospital and was immediately wheeled into the emergency operating room. The hospital's chief of surgery was immediately called in. Upon arrival and seeing the patient, the attending surgeon exclaimed, oh my God, it's my son. How do you explain this? It's funny because my, my script says, I'm confident the statistics in this room would be vastly different and it is, right? But what does it surprise anyone that around 40% of participants who are faced with this challenge do not think of the most plausible answer, that the surgeon is the boy's mother? Uh, instead, people have been known to invent elaborate stories, such as the boy was adopted, and the surgeon was his natural father, or the father in the car was a priest. Uh, without any evidence pointing to those as possible conclusions, right? This mental exercise, adapted from the work of bias researchers Pendry, Driscoll, and Field in 2007, demonstrates the powerful pull of automatic stereotyped associations. Uh, for some people, the association between surgeon and men is so strong that it interferes with their problem solving and making accurate judgments. I used to here to kick off my discussion on moving beyond bias. Slide, please. All right, so again, uh, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Cesar Nefrata, and I go by Harley, and I'm sure you're wondering, why am I sitting here listening to this dude talk about bias? Um, that's a fair question. Uh, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a sociologist. I'm not a senior leader or someone with a lot of influence, uh, but what I am is your ally. Uh, I'm here to tell you straight up that the biases you have experienced, maybe even as recently as last week, uh, in the workplace, it's real. Those are real. Um, I'm here as someone who doesn't look like you. Someone who may not have lived through your experiences, who doesn't face your daily challenges to tell you this. You're not crazy. You're not imagining it. You're not interpreting reality the way you want to see it. No, you have experienced legitimate bias, implicit or otherwise, and it may have cost you some opportunities. And while there are people out there who are actually trying to convince us that bias is some sort of imagined threat based on pseudoscience, uh, and that suggesting that it exists is somehow offensive, uh, we're going to reject that, and we're going to keep fighting. I'm a career intelligence officer, but for over the past three years while at headquarters air staff and now at AATC, I have been able to take my understanding of how bias negatively impacts my operational tradecraft and translate that same idea as a lens on how we lead people and manage talent. Uh, my team and I conducted bias workshops for Intel and Cyber Senior NCOs and FGOs during advanced training courses and for our senior leaders who were members of development teams preparing to score records 
and vector the next generation of leaders. So that's the perspective I hope to share with you today. Uh, here's my plan for the next half hour or so. Uh, we're going to get into some real talk, right? The first thing we need to do to move beyond bias is to first acknowledge it in ourselves so we truly understand where it comes from so that we can better deal with it. No one in this room, myself included, is above our own biases. Uh, I want us to all talk it, talk about it, get it out there, be more sensitized to them, uh, not just of those, um, not just those of others, right, but our own. Uh, this way we can be more productive uh, in having our discussions about it when it arises. I also want to clearly demonstrate how biases prevent you from getting a fair shot. And we're going to touch on some research to see how bias affects talent management. By doing this, bias becomes real, not some nebulous concept that lives in our imagination. And as we see these biases happen, we can react to them quicker. Look, I know you've heard about these biases before, uh, but they're still happening every day. And I want to arm you with as much information as possible to combat it. That's why my goal here is to make sure that you walk out of here better equipped as individuals and leaders of teams and uh, of organizations to counteract bias going forward. Uh, I'm going to give you strategies and tools, and I'm going to ask you to carry the message back to your organizations and put those techniques into practice. You'll notice that you don't see the words training or awareness. Did I put training or awareness on that slide? Nope. Um, this is about changing mindsets over time, and the long game requires revisiting these strategies and concepts over and over. Awareness is just the beginning, right? We have to move beyond bias by actively neutralizing it. Slide, please. All right, do me a small favor. Uh, if you're taking notes, uh, draw a heart on a sheet of paper. And we'll get back to it uh, in a little bit. In the last 15 years, over 1,400 studies and surveys have been published on the impact of unconscious bias. This research was conducted by the smartest scientists, neuroscientists, uh, working at the, the most highly respected academic institutions in the world. And what has all of that research taught us? First off, saying that we can function without bias is a non-starter. Right? Bias is essential to our survival. And it's not always negatively focused. Right? Having unconscious bias does not make you a bad person. It's just how our brains work. The key is to become aware of which biases are damaging. When bias is only seen as something that's negative or bad or wrong, it causes us to go in denial and drives that bias deeper and deeper into our subconscious. And that's how it gets baked into our, sub that's, that's how it gets baked into our processes. So rather than feel guilty about negative biases, it's better to take responsibility for them and to neutralize them. As humans, we're comfortable with the familiar and we push away the unfamiliar, right? Our brains and our senses take in something like 11 million pieces of information at any given time, but it's only able to actively process about 50 of those pieces. On top of that, as Homer illustrates, that information comes in and it's filtered by different lenses like familiarity, uh, habit, perceptions, or even comfort. Uh, neuroscience research shows us that close to 99% of our decisions are governed by the unconscious mind and driven by past experiences. Our brain relies on this experience to fill in gaps uh, of information and, and knowledge. And bias comes into play when we are in favor or against one thing, a person, or group compared to another. These are automatic, hidden responses that, share our, uh, that shape our expectations of others. And left unchecked, it creates a dynamic of us versus them, me versus you. So it's human nature, right? The trick is to consciously observe our unconscious biases. Getting past awareness of our bias and working towards actively neutralizing them means tricking our brains into not taking shortcuts that we have relied on since the caveman days to survive, hunt, and seek safety. It sounds difficult. It's actually not, but it, it does take some work. Slide, please. To become a conscious observer of your unconscious bias, you need to disrupt your OODA loop a little bit, right? Observe, orient, decide, act. We've been drilled from day one to tighten that loop as much as possible, and now I'm going to ask you to disrupt it. Instead of reading the slide as, Amazingly, your brain can read words without a problem even when the letters are out of order. Slow down, right? Try reading it as, examingly, your burn eye can raid rods without hit a problem evne when the letters are out of order. Yeah, it's goofy as hell, 
But taking a moment to see what is actually in front of you is a critical brain skill. When you form a judgment about someone, ask yourself how you came to that conclusion. To do that, you have to slow down and read the data that is in front of you. When we make decisions about people, we should take some time to determine whether our snap judgments stand up to the qualities, competencies, and performance that are really out there or not out there. It's like thinking about your breathing. It's easy to do, right, but it, it takes a deliberate effort. Uh, by, but being deliberate essentially mitigates a key facet of unconscious bias, and that's that rapid categorizing of people. Once an individual is categorized, they inherit all the attributes and traits of that category. From there, you start to notice information that confirms your expectations, and you start discounting other pieces of data that don't fit. It really becomes difficult to get out of that rut. Slide, please. Uh, I'll take a guess and say that uh, most of you probably drew the version on the left uh, and did not attempt to draw the more realistic version on the right. You know, I'm probably wrong in some spots, right? When I made that simple request, here's what happened. Your brains assumed that you did not need to spend time remembering, visualizing, and then designing an, an anatomically correct heart, right? So, so it took a shortcut. And you did it not out of malice or disregard of my request. Uh, you just did it. Your, your brain decided for you to draw an abstraction of a heart. Unconscious bias works off of abstractions just like that. They're seemingly harmless shortcuts, so your brain can process more important stuff. They help us distinguish between the familiar and the unknown, comfort and discomfort, likes and dislikes, safety and danger. This is why we can't survive without it. Why thinking we can get rid of our unconscious bias or claim that we don't fall victim to it are non-starters. Decision-making shortcuts are okay until our biases about people are based on faulty programming that goes acknowledged and unquestioned. Quickly binning people into inaccurate categories reinforces negative stereotypes. Worse, it can lead to attributing cause and effect to one's mistakes rather than acknowledging that something systematic might be at play. Again, as an intelligence officer, I would never go out there and admit that I form my assessments based on abstractions and shortcuts. Uh, I pride myself on applying critical thinking and relying on my skills to overcome assumptions, my blind spots, and, and groupthink. So why wouldn't I treat people that way? Slide, please. When it comes to talent management, unconscious bias is not about harming people. It's about helping people who fit our preconceptions, and that's why it's so pervasive. For example, a supervisor may identify someone as high potential because that person fits their model of what a high potential looks like. Without delving into the evidence, I trust my gut. But once someone has that label, the way they are perceived changes. Raiders may ensure special coaching or mentoring resources, assign them high visibility projects, provide additional support to ensure success, even rationalize away their errors and shortcomings. Uh, this is how assumptions take over and quickly become a reality. And all this help is great, but consider that the research shows that across various industries when identifying high potentials, Male managers are five times more likely to select men than women. He's born to lead. Female managers are two times more likely to select men than women. Industry research shows that for every woman that organizations actively identify for leadership, almost twice as many men are identified to achieve positions of higher authority. Again, assumptions take over, right? If we assume women can't lead, then we'll never prepare them to lead. The sinister side of talent management is that this kind of leadership development can be problematic if high potentials fit the unconscious bias of what a high potential, again, should look like, leading to a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'll know it when I see it. But organizations are full of people who, thanks to unconscious bias, may never receive this type of help because they don't look the part. And most commonly, this means women. Uh, that's a lot of talent left on the table, and that's how unconscious bias can influence talent decisions. Bias can compel people to favor those who are most similar to themselves, and that leads to a tendency for leaders to hire, promote, and develop people who mirror attributes or qualities that align with themselves. You remind me of a younger version of me. We are also very good at justifying our biases, 
Studies show that we exhibit a tendency to claim that the strengths of in-group members are more important selection criteria than the strengths of candidates with backgrounds different from our own. Knowing what kind of context gives us an idea how, how knowing that kind of context gives us an idea how raters and senior rater preferences can cause inequities and increase disparity. This shows how critical it is to have a framework that forces you to focus on specific qualifications and talents, not ambiguous characteristics that, that spur feelings of likability or familiarity. Someone who's easy to work with, a team player. Slide, please. I want to dig a little deeper into this talent management aspect because there is some research that backs the things many of you have experienced. The next two slides are derived from a research organization called the Center for Work-Life Law out of the University of California, San Francisco. Their research on bias that's present during performance evaluations has pretty interesting implications on the talent management process that, that we use, right? Whether it's OPBs and EPBs, uh, the awards programs, uh, EFDPs, stratification drills, uh, promotion boards, hiring for leadership positions. Uh, our biases tend to be activated during times of stress and when we need to make quick decisions that are already fa and we're already facing cognitive overload, fatigue, ambiguity, and time pressure. So talent management processes are a target-rich environment for unconscious bias. Research shows that a particular way bias can unconsciously play out is when people are evaluated from different lenses. Prove it again groups are stereotyped as less competent and their records are often, often have to demonstrate their performance over and over. This often includes women, people of color, individuals with disabilities, members of the LGBTQIA community, who tend to be more scrutinized, right, which means they have to repeatedly go above and beyond to demonstrate their competence. Their counterparts, meanwhile, are often given the benefit of the doubt and are rewarded for their potential. This means they are more often assigned projects uh, above their current level of knowledge, skill, and abilities than either women or people of color. This bias can lead to some people being called lucky while others are skilled. Some paying, off for, uh, some, some paying off for their mistakes and, and, and others are, are just completely written off. The tightrope is a concept where minorities suffer from a narrower range of accepted workplace behavior. Stereotypes may create pressures on women to be modest, mild-mannered, team players, so being considered ambitious is not a compliment for women. Being direct, competitive, and assertive, which are the three main qualities why I married my wife, right? That often results in being seen as tactless, selfish, and difficult. Women who promote their capabilities may be seen as prima donnas, instead of being acknowledged as confident in knowing their own worth. Taylor Swift knows what's up, right? Um, if you were a man, then you'd be the man. Um, <laughs> that's for my daughter, by the way. I just, no, I'm, I'm a total Swifty, I am. Um, with these limitations, though, it's, it's almost impossible to move beyond bias and to fairly compete for opportunities unless institutional processes are fixed. And even though we're making progress by overcoming outdated assumptions of caregiving, women still bear the brunt of parental bias. For example, how many of you have seen or have, been, have noticed in yourselves uh, a women's competence and commitment questioned after they had children, possibly losing out on high-profile opportunities with like leadership positions or advanced training. Working mothers may be stereotyped as distracted because their priorities lie elsewhere, yet when mothers work long hours, sometimes they can be harshly judged for their parenting. Bias can be so powerful that leaders sometimes assume that a mother will not or should not want high-profile opportunities, claiming it's not a good time for her. You cannot expect to remain competitive with these attitudes out there. Sometimes bias creates a tug of war or a conflict amongst underrepresented groups. People from historically excluded groups may feel the need to distance themselves from others of their group or align with the majority against their own in order to get ahead. This leads to a situation where these individuals pit themselves against one another and apply harsher standards to each other. Sometimes minorities hold members of their own groups to higher standards because they falsely assume that's what it takes to succeed here. This can start with simple criticisms like women faulting each other for being too feminine, or people of color faulting each other for being too white or not white enough. The last phenomenon has a star next to it 
because it can lead to something even more damaging when women do this to each other. And I'm not trying to preach at you, right? I just want to raise awareness, and I want to take a moment to briefly address the very real concept of internalized misogyny. This is when women subconsciously project sexist ideas onto each other and even onto themselves. Women who experience this may express it through minimizing the value of women, mistrusting women and seeing them as competitors, invalidating other women's accomplishments, and even showing gender bias in favor of men. Research shows that internalized misogyny can be pervasive, especially in the military, because the pick yourself up by your bootstraps mentality seems noble. The adversity you have experienced by making it in a man's world can no doubt be empowering, but that's your singular experience and it minimizes the power of allyship. Adversity and life's challenges do make us stronger, but we should harness that strength by trying to make the path clearer, not harder for those following in our footsteps. I internalized my own prejudice growing up as a first generation immigrant in the US and then moving to the Philippines. I spent most of my childhood looking down on Filipinos who weren't as American as I was. And it took a lot of time to overcome. Catch yourself when you feel inferior or when you find yourself judging others. Step back and evaluate. Be kind to yourself and give yourself some slack. And that takes us to the discussion of how to counteract bias in yourself and others. Slide, please. In talent management discussions, how often do you find or hear yourself uh, or hear others say, I just want the most qualified airman or guardian, right? Of course we do, right? No one wants the mid for, 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 for their, particular, their particular thing, right? That's, that's a completely valid approach. We create orders of merit to ensure we, we know who is the most qualified. But we have to dig deeper than that. Although people believe that we are making objective assessments of merit and treating people fairly, hidden preferences for people like us can cause to support development and career progression of some people over others without us even knowing we are doing so. The problem is, if people, have a solid, if people don't have a solid definition of most qualified in terms of actual standards and metrics that they can readily fall back on, they invite unconscious bias to set in. When people get busy or stressed or pressure ramps up and time runs short, we all fall back on mental shortcuts to make decisions. So without knowing exactly what it is you're looking for, you could subconsciously start selecting others in your own image simply based on familiarity. These interrupters are the ways we can move beyond bias, and more importantly, how you can advise others to move beyond their biases. Take these tools and make them standard practice for your teams and your organizations. They will come in handy, especially during boards, developmental discussions, and on hiring panels. Moving beyond bias is about institutional change. So put these into practice and model behavior for the people you lead so that they in turn can adopt it for themselves. And these seem really simple, right? But that also means they're easy to take for granted. And you have to be deliberate and you have to be intentional. Number one, fall back on your evidence. No matter what process is involved, when developing your airmen and guardians and managing talent, try best to avoid snap judgments. Don't rely on hunches, your gut, or the eye test. Find evidence to explain and back up your assessment. Be specific enough so that you can defend it and back it up with data, metrics, and documentation found in records. Number two, make sure to give everyone or no one the benefit of the doubt. Your people have to know where they stand. You can't rationalize shortcomings for some while holding others to stricter standards of performance. Objective requirements can't be applied rigorously for some and applied leniently for others. Make sure you are consciously weighing potential and performance separately and equally. Having clear, transparent criteria for evaluating qualifications and performance that are agreed upon by everyone is how to do it. Number three, clearly define overly vague concepts. Don't let anyone throw around loose concepts such as culture fit or leadership presence. Right? Start with a clear definition of what you are looking for and keep track to ensure standards are applied consistently. Also, you should be able to weed out personality traits from concrete skill sets. Rely on your objective standards and don't fall back on subjective and other personality-based metrics. Number four, 
Promote dialogue and open discussion, but by all means, call out bias. Honest discussions are necessary when managing your teams, but as those talks play out, who should be hired into leadership positions, who should get the number one strat uh, or the quarterly award, pay close attention to the arguments being made. Listen for phrases like, they come off as abrasive, or he seems to have a good attitude. Uh, these, don't, these phrases invite biases to influence decisions. Don't let people make their case this way. Demand reasons. And then number five, understand how stereotypes work and prove them to be inaccurate. Right, get inside your own OODA loop, right? We talked about that. Every day you should actively work on debunking your own stereotypes of people. For me personally, the key is to constantly work to understand those who are different from me so I can start interrupting shortcuts in my thinking by creating counter narratives. So tomorrow, I'm gonna do this at the airport while waiting at the gate for my plane. When I see a woman, when I see a lady in an airline uniform, I will accept that they are pilots and first officers until I see evidence indicating otherwise. Just a simple exercise like this goes a long way in reversing stereotypes and becomes automatic. And you start rebuilding those ruts in your thinking. And you flip the narrative and you create counter stereotypes. Slide, please. All right, I'd like to offer you a bonus strategy. Um, this one was taught to me and many people that she influenced by a former teammate of mine, uh, the brilliant and now retired Senior Master Sergeant Tondalaya T. Takapu. Raise your hand if you've ever worked with or supervised, have been considered what you'd call a go-to airman or guardian. Right, and I think we all know what this is, right? It's pretty pervasive. I'm sure we've all seen it. That incredibly difficult and complex TMT tasker comes down or a high pressure opportunity in front of senior leadership comes up, within three seconds, you know who is going to be assigned that task because they have a reputation for getting it done. So here's what T offered. Maybe consider getting rid of your go-to airman or guardian, not the actual airman or guardian. That would be weird, um, possibly illegal, right? <laughs> Just the concept. The next time an opportunity arises, and you find yourself quickly falling into habit by assigning it to your go-to, stop. Give that opportunity to someone else. Invite them to step up. But why would you want to? What's the incentive? Surely as a leader, it's going to make your life harder, right? You're absolutely correct. But you'll be better off for it, and here's why. First, it'll force you to pick up your own game. All right? You're not gonna let anyone on your team fail. You'll mentor them. You'll give them resources and time they need. You'll set them up for success. Second, wouldn't you rather have multiple people you know for a fact you can rely on to get after it? Not only will this build your bench over time, but it will also give you a truer sense of your team's capability at the individual level. If demonstrated performance is an indicator for you, this gives you a chance to collect real data. And lastly, in the end, what you'll have done is build a process that systematically prevents bias from taking root in your talent management process because the system you've created is fair. Everyone gets a shot to prove themselves. Remember, while we may not be able to eliminate all aspects of unconscious bias from person to person, structured processes like this tend to build more equity than unstructured processes. Slide, please. Okay, uh, before we move to Q&A, and I'm trying to like drag this out so I don't have to be like, you know, getting too many questions. <laughs> joking, not joking. <laughs> um, I wanna pitch an actual tool that's going to help the entire force move beyond bias. Something that's tangible, that's coming down the pipe, all right? I'm currently the program manager for a 10-year partnership between AETC and Arizona State University to develop and field an online resource designed to educate leaders at all levels from first-time supervisors to four-star generals. This leader toolkit is an immersive learning experience that will equip leaders with the resources to identify and counteract bias, leading to improved retention, development, and talent management. The toolkit is 10 hours of interactive content, including videos, discussion guides, scenarios, and off-the-shelf materials that can be used for any DAF member as needed for free. ASU had previously developed a toolkit for Starbucks five years ago. It was deployed worldwide and is still being used by the company. The existing toolkit is the foundation, and we are currently working on adapting it 
to our needs and transitioning it from a commercial retail sector focus to the profession of arms. Most importantly, uh, we need to capture the lived experience of airmen and guardians, especially how they've experienced bias and how it's impacted their careers. We're going to leverage all the expertise, experience, and innovation that ASU brings to the table and harness it against the unique challenges and requirements of the Air Force and Space Force cultures. Uh, the Air Force has expected our leaders to, to lean in and engage with the force, have difficult conversations, break down barriers, and, and eliminate disparities. But that charge came with, with few tangible tools and strategies available to everyone to do so. We need more work like barrier analysis. We need more tools like LIVE so that you're not on your own, having to individually innovate, take risks, and carve out your own time and resources to do what you can. We need more sustainable and scalable solutions that can be applied across the entire force, regardless of what unit you're assigned to uh, or what your job is. Right? For, uh, for, for as dynamic and demanding as our operating environments are, we need a solution that does not require synchronous, in-person, classroom-style training. We need content that's digestible, relatable, and available to us anytime we need it. So my team is currently working with ASU's Social Transformation Lab to create <clears throat> to counteract attitudinal, or I'm sorry, to create a lens that captures how vital it is for leaders to counteract attitudinal and institutional barriers so they can leverage all of their human capital, create organizational cultures, and create high-performing teams. That's why we're integrating the experience and the expertise of the DAF bogs. We need their perspectives to inform the toolkit's content. And it's not just about bias. It's about understanding our environments, equipping us with communication techniques, and providing mentorship and leadership strategies. It's also not one-time training. It's life work, a long-term investment. This toolkit will be free to users and available for up to 30,000 individual users every year. So towards the end of the summer, uh, be on the lookout for more details as we launch a pretty aggressive marketing and strategic communications campaign uh, ahead of the toolkit's deployment um, in the fall. Slide, please. Uh, OK. we. Uh, I left myself open for some questions, uh, but I first want to thank you uh, for, for allowing me to really this, this valuable time to sit with you uh, and be an ally. Uh, this is my day-to-day -day job, so please reach out to me directly if, if we don't get to your questions, um, if we don't have time for them, or if you want to take something offline. Like I said, this is, this is what I do for the Air Force, right? Um, so I'll definitely have time to hear you out, dig deeper, pull on a thread, whatever you need to do. Um, all right, I guess that's all I got. Thank you so much, and off to some questions. Okay, this time we'll open the floor for questions from our audience and online. And I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time seeing if there are anyone in the audience. Sir, could you get us started with maybe talking about um, where you think some of these biases gen um, generate from? Yeah, I mean, the, the research is pretty clear that these so-called um, gender and socialization norms that we grew up at, you know, that we grow up with, um, that differ from culture to culture. But I think we can all agree that, um, yeah, it starts with very early socialization, and, th and that's just the starting point. Right, of, of the these so-called cultural and gender norms that we, we grow up expecting to, to, to live in that world. But it's reinforced through things like uh, how, how women are depicted in mass media. Uh, it's reinforced by how quickly we can make judgments online with no repercussions. Uh, it's reinforced by um, the concept of popularity, right? And, and that's such a driving force for someone to want to inherit those, those perspectives that make them seem, um, I don't know, palatable to others. And as soon as that takes root, it's almost impossible to dial back bias unless you start understanding where it comes from um, and then not being ashamed of it, but being willing to, to counteract it and to move on. Thank you. I think there's a question over here. Hi, Michelle Leonard. Um, I work for the Eastern Air Defense Sector, did 23 years uh, at, uh, military, and then now I'm a GS employee. So over the course of my time in the military and then as a federal employee, I've had numerous amounts of feedback and one-on-one -on -one sessions, right, supervising, mentoring. And um, 
the conversation has become, you know, you're abrasive, you're difficult, right? How do you um, kind of change your supervisor's mindsets or, or use uh, more positive words so that it doesn't sound defensive, right? I'm not aggressive, like this is just my personality, you know, yeah. so. Yeah, I think there's multiple strategies at, at getting after this, and I, I will offer the one that um, I, I think is successful. Again, this is just, this is Harley's perspective, right? Um, but it's informed by my role model, uh, who's my wife, who, who, who has dealt with these struggles, you know, 24 years in the military. Um, and, and I've seen things in her, I've seen behaviors in her that have really inspired me. And, and here's the one that, that I take to heart is that, as we've just learned, bias is pretty pervasive, and it's across, across the entire spectrum of demographics. As leaders, we have an opportunity to model behavior by recognizing how others may fall victim to bias and then intervening in the way that we hope someone will intervene for us in the future, right? And what that'll do is it'll spark someone to say, okay, she's jumping in because she recognizes bias. I think we all need to check ourselves because as a victim of bias herself, she's willing to put herself out there to, to counteract the bias we're seeing for another demographic, right? The intersectionality to bias is so, uh, it could be so damaging, but also provides a surface area to operate as leaders to intervene and model behavior for others, right? And that does take some self-sacrifice to say, maybe I am just not quite strong enough to stand up for myself, because God knows I'm not sometimes, right? But I feel empowered to stand up for others. And when I model that behavior, I think it's infectious, and I hope that it'll be modeled to save my ass someday. Hey, hey sir, when we talk about um, communication around biases, could you take a minute and, and distinguish between microaggressions and, and communicated bias? Yeah, absolutely. Um, microaggressions, what, what, a, what a crazy term, because um, the impact is neither micro and the intent is, is most of the time, normally not aggressive. What you're seeing is an output of unconscious bias because microaggressions occur when the person who says something may not have a negative intent, but the impact to the receiver is absolutely negative. And there's a teaching moment here. And again, it's not a strategy for everyone. I'm not trying to preach to y'all, but as a victim of a microaggression, what I find to be most helpful for myself is to not react, at least for a second. Take a breath, and I realize that what's in front of me is a teaching opportunity to dig deeper, right? Curious, not furious. Um, and that teaching moment is both for me and for the person who, who said the microaggression, because I understand that that is an output of unconscious bias. And now, knowing that, I want to help them be a conscious observer of their own bias. So that microaggression is flipped on its side and goes from possible insult to a learning opportunity for them to just be a better person. Yeah, that's excellent. Thank you for that. Um, I see another question from the audience. Hi, good morning. I'm sorry, I'm Gil, um, weather forecaster over at Shaw Air Force Base. And um, thank you again for this presentation. I love talking about biases, especially in the workplace. But as you're going through your tools, I do have a question about your, your bonus um, bias tool. Uh, where you said to essentially get rid of your go-to. How do we go about doing that without shafting the go-to who has clearly earned that opportunity? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And that was usually the first question that, that T would be faced with when she, when she, um, when she used this as a, as a tool, right? And I love T's response because she said, rock stars will always be rock stars. If that person truly was your go-to, there'll be a go-to again, right? But what's more important than the individual getting access to opportunities is making sure that there's equity across the board. And that's someone who may not be, uh, you know, someone who's an introvert like myself, who's not gonna always speak up for high pressure opportunities, um, who's terrified in a setting like this, may not be able to prove themselves, right? And I know you know people that you work with in that situation. So the go-tos will always be go-tos. They will find their opportunities they will get out there and prove themselves again. Rock stars will be rock stars. Uh, but the biggest concern is, is the team and the organization. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Would you like to go ahead? Hi, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Shook from 16th Air Force. Um, just had a quick question for you. So 
you are, um, in my opinion, relatively privileged to be able to do this full time. Um, I know some folks, some men, who want to be allies, or at least have expressed some, you know, desire to kind of sort of support. Um, what would you recommend for them to do to be able to maintain focus on their primary role? Um, but how can they how can they support in like a you know supplementary or secondary kind of role? Yeah, I, I think we need to shift the narrative on this type of work, right, and not treat it as something extra or a passion project or something that we're interested in, and just start treating it like tradecraft. This is just leadership tradecraft. Uh, I'm not a big person that, that uh, on, on soft skills versus hard skills, I, I hate those terms, because it's, it's all tradecraft. Um, and I was a very, very immature captain when I was on active duty who thought that if I was so mission focused that people would take care of themselves. And that sounds ridiculous, but I was so tied to that philosophy. Um, but I think if we flip that and we stop treating this as a side hustle, right? I am privileged that this is my job and has been for the past three years and was able to go to, to, to IDE for it and study something like this. But what I'm trying to help people is realize that this doesn't have to be a side thing. This just has to be the way you approach airmen and guardian development, leadership, uh, team building. Right? And it is part of your tradecraft no matter what career field you're in. You have to work with people. You have to lead them. Um, so don't let anyone trick you into thinking you're spending additional time on learning how to be a leader. Right? It's just something that we're supposed to be doing all the time. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you, Lieutenant Colonel Nefrata, for all you've shared with us and appreciate your passion for this subject. Um, before we break, um, uh, sorry, there'll be a 10 minute break. Um, coming back at 1040 for, this, for the next session, which is Breaking Barriers, How Athenas Successfully Navigate Obstacles to Readiness. Thank you again. We're gonna be talking about breaking barriers how Athenas successfully navigate the obstacles to readiness. We do understand that we're the last spot a panel before lunch, but we promise to make it worth your while. Some of you may not be familiar with the Athena program, and therefore with me this morning are five amazing women to talk to you guys more about it. First, Lieutenant Colonel Kimberly Collier, Major Sharon Arana, Major Beverly Meister, Major Kristen Keene, and Chief Master Sergeant Rebecca Schatzman. They're here to share information about the program with you all, but more importantly, to let you guys know how they are individually breaking barriers and how you all can do the same. But before we get started, ladies, for y'all mind just introducing yourself by letting us know your name, um, where you're currently assigned, your career field, and how many years you've been in the military. Yeah, hi, first of all, thank you everyone um, for having us, this is amazing. So I am Major Sharon Arana, I go by Spider. Um, I am career intel, so I'm 26 years prior enlisted. So I've got like a couple of years under me. And like I said, I am an Intel officer, 14N, stationed at Langley on ACC staff, and I'm currently serving as the 14N functional area manager. Hey everyone, thanks for uh, having us today. This is absolutely wonderful. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Rebecca Schatzman. I'm from the 911th Airlift Wing in Pittsburgh, Air Force Reserve Command. I am the 911th Operations Group, SEL. Um, on the airframe side, I am a C-17 loadmaster, prior C-130H flight engineer, and prior one Charlie and prior aircraft dispatcher on the outside. Mom of two, happy to be here. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm sorry, good morning. So this is the first time I get to speak on an Athena panel, so I'm very excited to be here. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Kim Collier. I am a 22-year EOD qualified civil engineer officer, so proud engineer. I am also a proud Washington Air National Guardsman. I was four years active duty, and this is actually my fifth guard state. Uh, currently on orders with National Guard Bureau, getting ready to transition to orders with PACAF, but very proud to be here. I am the Air National Guard co-lead for ARC Athena. Hi, everyone. Good morning. I am Bev uh, Major Beverly Meister. I come from the 618th Air Operations Center, TACC, at Scott Air Force Base, Illinois. Um, I am a flight nurse. Um, so I. I do the command and control for AE operations at TACC. Um, I have been in service for 13 years now. Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm Major Kristen Keene. Uh, I am currently at headquarters, Air Force Special Operations Command, uh, getting ready to transition to be the director of operations for the 11th Special Operations Intelligence Squadron. 
I am a career intelligence officer and I have been in the Air Force for about nine years. Thank you, ladies. Major Rana, this first question is for you. Just to set the ground, can you let us know fundamentally what is the Athena program? Yeah, great. So Athena program, for those who don't know, we'll go back a little bit in history, a little bit in time. Back in 2020, Sword Athena was set up at Air Combat Command. It was intended to be a MAGCOM level professional development program that evolved into this amazing grassroots effort to increase readiness by identifying barriers to readiness for our marginalized airmen, but specifically aimed at women and families. So since then, it's kind of, um, again, grown across multiple MAGCOMs, and as you'll see throughout the course of this panel, we've sort of molded it into like what fits our own missions. Thank you for that. So each of you seems to be representing different match comms, likewise different specific programs within the Athena, Athena program. Can each of you for a second just share with us which Athena you are representing and more so what initiatives your specific programs have worked on? I'll start first with you, Chief. Yes, ma'am, thank you so much. Um, I really love telling the story. I'll, I'll try to tell it quick. Um, if you have the chance, please grab us afterwards. Uh, the story is much more involved. Um, it's a combination for us at, at ARC Athena as we pair with each other. For those who don't know, ARC is Air Reserve Component. That's AFRIC and the Air National Guard. A lot of folks don't know that. Um, it's a combination of innovation, perseverance, and good leaders that listen, quite frankly. Um, we started off as a conversation, which is, which is really insane to see where we're at right now. We were at a, C a CEA course, which is a career enlisted aviator course in San Antonio. Issues were brought up there with our MAGCOM functional manor manager regarding uh, female aviators and the barriers that they faced. He said to us at the end of the meeting, I can't believe this has happened. I didn't know this. How can I help? He put us in contact with a local WIT team, and, and that was the first step. That chief was Chief Frederick Fowler. He is from A3, and he is now retired, and he was the first crucial part in this. He said he went back to his unit at A3 or at headquarters, and he said, uh, hey, sir, this was General Durham at the time, there's an airman out there that has something to talk about, and it involves our uh, enlisted aviators and the barriers they face. So again, they put us in contact with WIT. We started uh, doing some research, and we found an Athena program, and this was Sword Athena, actually. Um, whenever we uh, read about it, we thought, well, I wonder why this doesn't exist in the, in the reserve command. And at that point, I wasn't thinking about the guard. Um, so I went ahead and, and wrote a BBP. I sent it to Chief Fowler, and before you know it, I, I swear in about two weeks, uh, there was multiple general officers in my inbox asking how they could help, which was pretty scary as I was a senior at the time. Uh, so I had no idea how to deal with that. Um, Went to, I went to an off, a WIT offsite afterwards, and I met Chief Dawson. I met both Chief Dawson and Colonel Lang. Colonel Lang was on ACC Sword Athena and one of the integral uh, stand-up parts of that. Chief Dawson, who you met earlier today, he's from the Air National Guard. He saw our idea, and he said, you know what? I don't think you're thinking big enough. I think you should involve the Air National Guard. So at that point in time, he gave me a POC in the Air National Guard, and we paired up, and we went full force together. Um, my wing commander, prior wing commander, will tell, tell you all that I cornered him on the airplane on a local flight one day, which is probably true. And uh, <laughs> I said, hey, sir, I think we have something moving here, and we really would like to uh, get after it. So he said, I support you in any way possible. Uh, long story short, with a lot of perseverance and a, a lot of continual talks and, and briefings, we had a charter signed within six months from Lieutenant General Lowe from the Air National Guard and Lieutenant General Healy from the Air Force Reserve Command. We held a senior leader event with over 200 participants. We have nine LOEs, which we'll talk about later, multiple policy releases and success stories. The biggest accomplishment that we have so far is we have about 162 volunteers, which is, which is really incredible. Um, all ranks, all service members across Air Force Reserve Command and Air National Guard. Um, the strongest bit is that we have senior leaders that back us incredibly so. Uh, you heard Chief Nunez yesterday, if you were in the SEL Summit, talk about it. General Sabrick, who's right here in the front row, she was on our initial IPR with Lieutenant General Healy, and she stepped in and backed us every step of the way, and we cannot thank you enough for that. Lieutenant General Healy is our biggest advocate, and it's absolutely wonderful. For those, again, who don't understand, we have five different statuses in the Air Force Reserve Command and the Air National Guard. That's a big deal when it comes to benefits and what your entitlements are, and that's a lot that, that people don't understand and when we need to really look at policy change. We represent the voices combined of over 189,000 airmen, which is 
a lot. Um, <laughs> so we try to do our best to fit the mold and help them. Again, Arc Athena started as a discussion. It started by a random senior master sergeant, C-17 loadmaster at the unit level, and it was good leaders that listened that brought us to you all today. Thank you. Thank you for that, Chief. And Major Arana, can you just tell us more so what, or Athena, you're represented, and more so what programs you guys are working on? So as I said earlier, I'm Sword Athena. Sword Athena was the first Athena to get stood up. Um, we also have our villain story, background story. Um, so then Kamek, uh, now retired General Holmes, went up to Colonel Lang. Um, she's amazing, and um, we all fangirl over her. Hi. <laughs> Um, but so he went to Colonel Lang and asked her, I, I want to do a women's, you know, leadership sort of forum for professional development, realizing that, you know, there was a gap or there was a need to speak to the women within ACC and ask, like, what are things that we are missing? How are we not supporting you? Well, Colonel Lang took that and said, why don't we take this a step farther and make it something, a summit where there's going to be change that comes out of it. And so essentially she took the weapons and tactics model, right, that comes out of weapons school and it's something that is tried and true, especially within ACC, took that model and said, why don't we go ahead and just apply that to this, you know? And so the first Sword Athena um, was put together and it was virtual. We, that was 2020, um, we just, like finalize our fifth summit about two weeks ago. Um, we are going to brief um, COMAC on 30 April. So it's kind of just exploded. And then since then we have, as you see, multiple Athenas have come from that. Um, we now, in 22, we also had our former formal charter was signed by COMAC in 2022, basically making us official. Thank you for that. And Major uh, Meister, the same question for you. Uh, like Major Arana was saying, so Sword Athena stood up first, and then it was Reach Athena next after that, and that was during the height of COVID, 2020. Um, I think it was kind of built out of isolation and frustration with um, the previous members that were on the team that, that initiated Reach Athena. Um, you know, teleworking and figuring life, trying to juggle everything, kids, not me personally, but I'm talking about the people that stood up Reach Athena, but and also them being more of a senior officer and still not really knowing what resources were available to them. Um, that's how it got started because as the officers were thinking, well, how do I not know what resource, resources are available? Maybe the airmen aren't also knowing what, what is available to them. Um, so that's kind of like she was saying, the grassroots of how and why it got stood up. And I think for AMC, really knowing our mission um, helps us to identify what barriers or what potential barriers that we're facing or going to face, right? So um, with AMC's mission, um, taking a look at where our airmen are going. They're, they're out there executing rapid global mobility, you know, in support of air refueling, airlift, um, air mobility support, and air medical evacuation. So knowing that these airmen are going to be tasked at a moment's notice to go global, right? We're not just one AOR, it's global operations. Um, this is how we're finding out like long sorties, long mission days, crew duty day, flight duty period, everything. Like what are the potential barriers that women and their families are facing because of just what the AMC's mission is. Um, and so what we do is just help to identify those policies that currently exist and maybe try to tweak those policies, whether it's intentional or not, that are maybe driving our talent away. We want to keep our talent. You know, um, going off of a, uh, a, a uh, aviator's career timeline, right? You, you get in, you learn the mission, you're, you're operational for that first like 10 years or so, you're upgrade. Um, then you do your PME as well. So at what point, you know, if you are trying to start a family, where does that fit into your timeline without losing your wings, without recall, and, and, and things that a lot of people don't necessarily think about um, that is really affecting our mobility airmen. So thank you.
Thank you, Major Meister. And before I move on, just Major Keene, any additional comments? Yeah, thanks. Great question. Um, so uh, at AFSOC, we face some different challenges than the rest of the, the Air Force. So uh, our air commandos are, are subjected to two chains of command. So when we make policy changes and there are barriers to service, they're not just changes that we have to make at the Air Force level, but we also have to make them and get buy-off from U.S. SOCOM. Uh, Special Operations Command. Our air commandos are in austere locations uh, preparing for the next great power competition fight. And we have an incredibly high ops tempo and some pretty resilient air commandos. Uh, we also have an incredible support team. I know um, Colonel Menser is here, so great to see you, ma'am. Um, uh, a great mentor for our Dagger Athena team. And, and really, this has evolved uh, quite a bit. I'll talk about, we've got a lot of exciting efforts happening, um, and we have involvement all the way from our, our defenders at the NCO and Nairman level all the way up uh, to senior leaders and have uh, gotten buy-in from COMAFSOC. So we're really excited to be here and, and see the changes and uh, that we're really helping overcome barriers um, at, that have been identified at the grassroots level. Thank you for that. And leaning off of that uh, comment, you talked about the exciting efforts that you guys are working on. Can each of you just talk briefly about some of, some of the initiatives that your specific Athenas are working on? I'm going to start first back with you, Major Keen. <laughs> what are some of those exciting efforts that you guys are working on? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I just want to start from the beginning. So uh, real quick, one of our first big wins uh, at the AFSOC Dagger Athena and with our AFSOC Women's Initiative team is that we were the first MAGCOM to get a blanket acceptance of risk for Bluetooth breast pump breast pumps on all aircraft. So that was a really big win for us. And so we're working through the AFSOC corporate process, which has been probably our biggest effort and, and muscle movement is to normalize changing these barriers to readiness and removing them through the corporate process and getting buy-in from the rest of our air staff uh, and our, our staff uh, counterparts. Um, and so we're working for a 1067 to formalize that so that as we have change in leadership, we do not lose that acceptance of risk um, for that, for that uh, equipment. Uh, we have uh, several LOEs that we're working on right now. Number one, fitment. So we have s three sub-LOEs underneath that. One is tactical vest. So identified by a couple NCO defenders that shorter stature airmen, uh, the standard issue t uh, vests do not fit them. And so it causes issues with them uh, needing to rapidly draw their sidearm, uh, place a, an, a rifle on their shoulder. And so they have come up with a solution that is already standard issue among uh, our special tactics air commandos uh, to potentially solve some of those problems. Uh, we also are looking at the self-contained breathing apparatus, again, nominated by uh, an NCO and civilian air uh, firefighter that we have uh, in AFSOC, knowing that the back plates that are issued to our air commandos and really are only available to all firefighters in the Air Force are too big. So that's causing long-term and short-term pain for our firefighters and removing them from the fight because it's forcing distribution of weight on their shoulders instead of on their hips. Uh, so they're working with the, the contracted entity to develop prototypes and, and with AFWorks to develop uh, new and creative ways to provide solutions that fit all air commandos, not just females. Uh, we also have a tactical cold weather gear. So I mentioned that our air commandos are operating in austere locations. So what we currently have is a, is a great solution, but it doesn't come in female-specific sizes. So you often have ill-fitting equipment, which can cause uh, injury when exposed to, to uh, cold and, and uh, for a long period of time. So we have air commandos that are operating in negative 40 degree temperatures, and uh, we really need to follow our Canadian, I know we have a Canadian uh, partner in here, but we need to follow our Canadian and special forces uh, lead who have already contracted with uh, uh, um, with uh, vendors to develop female specific cold weather gear uh, we also are working a line of effort um, pregnant airmen voluntary deployments the voluntary is a very important part of that I know that's a scary line of effort um, but really we just want to provide airmen the choice to plan their family and how they want to support the mission while they're uh, potentially expanding their family uh, and with that uh, related um, in pregnancy, we're working on a specialized case manager line of effort, which has already made pretty big strides uh, recently and gotten some support from SOCOM and from the DAFWIT and uh, Air Force level. And this really would be assigning an uh, RN case manager to our pregnant air commandos postpartum and during their pregnancies so that they receive all the care that they need um, and addressing that 25% uh, return to readiness uh, limit barrier that we have for uh, our pregnant air commandos uh, after the 13th month, month postpartum. 
And finally, we've also been uh, co collaborating a lot with, with the DAFWID and uh, on, the, on bladder relief devices to ensure that we are finding the most uh, ergonomic solutions for our aviators that, so that they can fly in comfort and are not needing to tactically dehydrate or um, potentially sit in an uncomfortable position for a long period of time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Certainly, you all have been busy, so thank you for all those efforts. Lieutenant Colonel Collier, ma'am, I'm going to come over to you and ask you what initiatives you all are working on. Thank you. So, what, one thing I want to draw your attention to, because I have a feeling my fellow panelists will, will minimize what is really a continual initiative and something that we all do, and I have to compliment my counterpart, Chief Shotsman, is trying to educate our senior leaders mm -hmm. because it is a constant, it is just, it's a challenge. They have difficult schedules, the Air Force is changing, I think we're all waiting to see what happens with great power competition and as we kind of evolve with the units of action. So, what Chief Shotsman did, and she kind of glossed over it when she introduced it, Signing that charter between not just one MAGCOM, but also including our representative in the National Guard Bureau, which is a MAGCOM equivalent. The Air National Guard, if you didn't know, it's a component. It's a MAGCOM equivalent. National Guard Bureau does not totally operate the same as a MAGCOM. Um, she achieved both signatures on that. She got, she truly stood up Arc Athena. So that is a continual initiative, because like I know in the Guard, we're about to have a new director of the Air National Guard and command chief. So that's something we're already starting to work, because that will be coming this summer. So that is active. Um, for our actual lines of effort with all those amazing volunteers she mentioned, we have nine lines of effort um, that they were stood up last year. They're, they're still current. Each of those kind of have sub elements that our LOE leads um, have established. And a lot of those you'll see like there's a shared theme with the Department of the Air Force Women's Initiative team with the other Athenas, um, the categories such as child care, pregnancy discrimination and maternal bias specialized female health care, countering sexual assault and harassment. Uh, those, those are also our lines of effort. We just put a little, little different nuance on them. We have a little more pointed um, efforts. Chief Shotsman will give you a little more details on some like the exceptional family member program, uh, maternal fitness. But what we focus on, what makes us a little bit different is it, it falls back to those statuses that Chief was talking about. So all those, you know, our lives, our professional lives tend to be governed by Air Force instruction. We have rules and regulations. Most of those, you know, if you have to look at that fine print on that first page of the AFI, a number of those apply to total force. But what you see is when you drill down into it, you go line by line, not all of them cover all our members in different statuses. So I know last week at the SEL panel, or I'm sorry, yesterday at the SEL panel, we spoke about the reserve component uh, parental leave parity act that just happened last year. So that was to help our members in, in active duty statuses. So we know we have AGR members who fall in line with active duty benefits, um, but a large percentage of our force are traditional guardsmen. They're traditional reservists. They are part-time warriors. And so that's what our lines of effort focus on, the shared theme of some of the struggles that we share with everyone, but then trying to focus more on what makes us just a little bit different in the reserve and, and guard. And then I will turn it over to Chief Shotsman to share some of our other. I have the wins, which is a, a amazing. And uh, we have so many, like she had mentioned, um, but these few I, I thought were really high to, to mention to you all today. Um, and this is for the young airmen in the crowd who don't think they can, you can. Uh, we have a tech sergeant out there right now who leads one of our LOEs. Uh, there were 2,100 maternity flight suits that were released throughout all the match comms and the reserve command got zero. This tech sergeant went out and she found the way to get with Air Force Material Command so we can order them. It is a huge success. We also made a female flight suit catalog complete with NSN so we can order efficiently. Mm -hmm. EFMP, that's one of our largest LOEs that impacts exceptional family members across the arc. We successfully briefed the Air Reserve, Air, Air Reserve Forces policy in January. We just got word two weeks ago they accepted it, they voted on it, accepted it, and we got assigned two, two Star Generals to champion it. I think uh, with all of those wins, the biggest piece of it is, is we are able to give our data to senior leaders. They take our data to Congress, they present it to quality of life panels, and they give it to congressional staff members. This alone helps us lead the fight because we know the change starts at the top. Thank you. Thank you for that, Chief. And what about you, Major Meister? What initiatives are you guys working on? I'm really proud of AMC's Reach Athena. Um, I would say I'm newer to the team. I've been on the team for a year now. But in the last, since it stood up in 2020, here's everything that has, is already implemented now. Um, there's six of them. 
Um, the AMC Commander Hair Policy Letter of Support, so allowing us with our hair uh, standards, um, that was in the fall of 2020. This one is, is actually really interesting. So um, support for nursing civilians. This is one that I did not know uh, was even a barrier because it doesn't apply to me, right? I think maybe a lot of us might say that, like in the previous brief, does the biases. Um, but this was affecting our civilian counterparts that we work with day in and day out. So the mothers, they were, um, it, there was basically nothing documented in writing that says that they can go and pump without having a clock out. Mm -hmm. So they were, they were um, basically having to clock out to go pump and not being paid for that. Mm -hmm. Like something that sounds so silly, you know, like really? Like that just because it's not written in a policy or something somewhere. Um, so that one was a pretty easy, easy one to get through. Um, so now it does say that they do not have to clock out to go and pump, <laughs> and there's a lactation room to do so. Um, so that was um, April of 2021. Um, there's now the CDC no hat, no salute policy across AMC, and I think that one went DAF, right? Do you guys have it too? Okay, yeah. So DAF level now. Um, and so for people that are going into the CDC and you want to drop off your kids, you want to pick up your kids, you know, sometimes your hands are full, you've got a baby in one arm, a bottle in the other, a stroller, like sometimes there's not always the time and place to render a proper customs, uh, custom and courtesy salute, right? So that one was, uh, is designated as no hat, no salute now. That was June of 2021. Um, like Major Keen alluded to, the Bluetooth breast pumps and skiffs and aircraft is, is implemented now. That was May 2022. Um, the flight duties while pregnant policy update, that was a big one, right? Uh, 8 March 2022, that, that pushed through. And then also the privacy and discretion for pregnant airmen, that was July of 22. Um, so those are the implemented ones. And then I have some facts I wanted to just spit off real quick. So AMC specific, right? That's what I'm here for. So the flight duties while pregnant, why is this important? Active duty women currently represent 8% of the rated aviation officers, 12% of career enlisted aviators, guard and reserve, 10% of rated aviators. On average, there are 400 aviators pregnant every year. Only 6% of Air Force pilots are women. 63% male rated officers continue to serve beyond 13 years of service. 39% of female rated officers continue to serve. Why do I tell you all this? Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. The goal, because our goal is we want to prevent the loss of combat capability. Um, we want to maintain our readiness capacity. You know, we're spending all these multi-million dollar training and recalls and, and training requirements. We don't want to lose that. We want to keep our talent. Um, so not only that, but bolster the retention and the recruitment and the morale of our women aviators. Uh, so currently, we have a lot of stuff that's ongoing. Um, also, before I forget, I did put out, put out a bunch of swag in the main auditorium, so make sure to try to grab something. But um, So current one, this is a really big one, and, and how Chief was talking about, you know, started with a tech sergeant. This current initiative, it's called Rosie's Spirit Tactical OCP Cap, which I have right here. This initiative has been probably in the works for about a year and a half now. It started with two female staff sergeant, aircraft maintainers stationed at Dover. Um, with their requirements and you know, safety requirements of working on aircraft, they still have to wear a bun. They can't wear their hair relaxed. Um, and they're required to wear, it's called a bump cap, like an insert into uh, their OCP cap. Well, they were finding that, okay, so I'm trying to work underneath the jet, the hat keeps slipping off, it doesn't fit my head properly. Um, long story short, they designed and implemented a, this version of an OCP cap, and there's multiple versions available right now, and they have their own like website, they have their own QR code that you can go and order it, but the goal of this is so that it can be either the hat that the Air Force issues, specifically you know, for, for those AFSCs, or that anybody can go and purchase this hat. Um, 
And it, it's not just for women, it's all gender inclusive too. Uh, hair types, hair textures, the opening in the back. I could talk all day about this hat. So if you wanna come <laughs> find me after, we can chat more about it. But um, it's really great. And so what we're working through now to get this initiative, keep it going, is um, funding. So A4 at, at a headquarters, Scott Air Force Base, they have agreed to, we're gonna do a test bed so at Travis and at Dover, they've agreed to purchase a certain amount of the OCP caps um, as, you know, in working through legal and, and things like that, like it had to be 100% US made. So all the materials um, to put the hat together. And that's one of the things that's been a struggle I know for them is trying to find different vendors because some parts come from Germany. This part comes from South Korea. This part's made in the US. And so with the certain laws that are in place, the Barry, Barry Act, um, and there's another law I'm forgetting right now, but keeping those in mind while still trying to implement things, like yes, it's hard work, it's been a struggle, but we're almost there, and like we can see the finish line. So um, I only say that as, as an encouragement, if there's something that you guys have an idea of, you want to make better, it's going to take time, it's going to take research, and it could take a few years, a couple years, but it, it's worth it, it'll be worth it. I promise you that. Um, so, like I said, I could talk about that one all day. I'll, I'll continue with the other ones that we're currently working on as well. Um, and this one, transfer of educational benefits. This is definitely a DOD thing, right? It's not just AMC, it's like DOD wide. Um, and actually last year I was fortunate to go to another conference. If you've, never heard, if you've ever heard of JULES, they call it JULES, Joint Women's Leadership Symposium. Um, led by the Navy, and it's, it's all branches now. But one of the, um, like a Q&A that we, I wasn't on the panel, I was an attendee, but one of the members stood up and was asking about this from the Marines. So it's definitely a DOD thing, but um, basically the service commitment required, so when you transfer your educational benefits to dependents, you know, why do you need to incur more time if you've already met, if you're at, already at a certain mark in your career? Um, we also are working on a support for families of dependents with braces. Braces. Um, this one, again, for me, I personally did not know this, right? Because, um, and, and, and I will say before I forget, all of these initiatives are from somebody's experience. It's an airman story. And I say that because this one in particular was um, one of our teammates on Reach Athena, that she's currently going through this now with her kids. I think she's got four kids. They're at that age where they need braces and TRICARE and working through that and how they're coded. Um, and then especially for when you go in PCS, you don't maintain that code, it drops off, so then you have to start care all over again. So another long process, right? Um, so that one is ongoing as well. We have a pregnancy loss and support trifold that we do have. We want to be able to like put it in clinics or as a supervisor that you know what, what support is available. Um, so even as a male supervisor or you know, if, if you might not personally experience a loss, how to support your airmen and your troops that are or that have but basically, this is a consolidated document, like a trifold that has all the regs put into one document. Because there's a lot of regs that dictate what, what classifies a dependent, um, you know, at stages of development, gestational, um, laws, things like that. So it's, it's one, it's all one document source. Um, let's see, we've got assist with female Advanced Air Crew Combat Uniform. So this one, I know you can't see me, but I'm wearing, this is my female flight suit. Um, so we're um, tied with the POC for that who can help issue those to other installations. Air Crew Access to OB Care. This is kind of like a follow-on to the, um, the waiver that you can get to fly while you're pregnant. So we're real, we were realizing through stories and experiences that we're getting told like, okay, cool, I can fly while I'm pregnant, right? Like things are cool, but now um, I'm DNIF for a long time, right? Duties do not include flying, DNIF. 
So we realized, okay, maybe we need to create kind of a timeline that the medical treatment facilities need to stick to um, because the OB providers and flight docs need to communicate. So we're working through that. We are working with Arc Athena on one of their LOEs, um, aircraft limitations and sanitation. This one is basically, they want to install a, like a little trash can, like in a KC-135 that you can go and put your sanitized, what do I say, feminine products, right? Um, and like a hand wash station on other aircrafts as well. So we're teaming up on that. And with Dagger Athena as well, with the, uh, her voluntary pregnant deployment LOE. So we're teaming up with that. Thank you. Thank you for all of that. I appreciate the efforts. And likewise, I commend you all for all the work that you all have done so far. Major Ron, I'm going to ask you a two-part question. Um, just in the interest of time, we do have some questions from attendees online. I want to make sure we have time for our attendees in person to ask their questions. So I want to ask you a two-part question. The first is, what initiatives are you guys working on? And then second is, how do you choose what to prioritize um, as you all work through these various recommendations and inputs for the field? Yeah, thanks for that. So current initiatives, um, we also have a laundry list. I will say that many of our initiatives being the first um, humble brag, but a lot of it helps, you know, we help each other out. And so the um, breast pumps on jets started with the skiffs, right, allowing them into skiffs, which started with Sword Athena. We also did the no hat, no salute, um, oh, the hair, right? So. <laughs> General Holmes was the first general officer to send a memo of support to the uniform board, and then that kind of started the wheels going, you know, to get additional support. But it goes both ways. So we'll say that things like pregnancy masking was something that came up at Sword Athena a couple of years ago, and we were having difficulty getting traction with that. And then we actually was General Minahan over at AMC, right, who released a memo, and so he started it. So we across Magicoms, we help each other out, which is probably one of the, the greatest strengths about this organization or this model that we have. We are currently working, well, we just ended our sort of Athena, like I said, so we brief on 30th, so um, not really want to like, you know, let anything out yet, and so we brief Comac, but I will say from last year, one of our significant wins was we stood up a female fitment position within ACC A3, and the intent of that is to create a cross-functional team to try and gather all of the requirements that we have out there within ACC and working with AFSOC as well about, you know, what, what are we missing? Where, where are we missing the mark with female equipment when we talk about bladder relief? And not just bladder relief, right, but also for our defenders and um, safety gear for them as well, cold weather gear. Really excited. The intent of that is not to have a female fitment position. The intent of that, and I think that the intent of all of us, you know, all of our organizations, is really just to start normalizing these processes, right? Is to realize that women are not other, you know, and that we are an integral part of this force. And like, it shouldn't be that the default or the model is the male, you know, and then, and then we just are just miniaturized men, you know, who have to fit into smaller uniforms. Like, we have to address all of our needs across the force. So the female fitment position was built with that intent of we just want to stand up a cross-functional team, collect all of the requirements, and then figure out where in the process are we failing to where it's a female fitment thing, because this should be normalized. Um, this should be just a part of the everyday process, and, and hopefully, it, or it will, you know, in a couple of years' time, we won't need that office anymore, because, again, all of these issues are being addressed naturally. So. Um, we also worked with AFIS in making sure that we increase the availability of maternity uniforms. Still an ongoing problem, you know, but at least we were able to, at COMEX level at least, put that on AFIS table as well and say, hey, listen, this is an issue, you know, and if you AFIS want to continue supporting your military members, you know, this is a vital part as well as to make sure that availability of maternity uniforms becomes a priority. And then when you asked about how we go about picking what it is that we do or what we work on, unlike some of the other Athenas, we do not have like a list of standing LOEs. Essentially what we do is every year we have four to five, we call them um, focus areas. And so every year they shift a little bit, they kind of tend to stay the same with a couple of changes. So this year's was workplace and training, that tends to be a constant. 
Female Fitment fell under that this year because of the Fitment, you know, standing up the female Fitment position. We do psychological, um, psychological health and safety. Our third one is family readiness. That was a little bit of a change. It used to be family support. And then we realized the past few years that family support wasn't necessarily support, it's readiness, right? And the importance of understanding that if our families are ready, then we are ready, right? If when we deploy, we should be able to not have to worry about what's happening back home. And so we shifted the lens a little bit this year to family readiness. We also held a family readiness summit at Langley, which is amazing. We just had leadership, um, oh my gosh, we had like from command chief level participation, base level, we had so much leadership was behind us on this. Um, and then our last one is also new, is single airmen and joint spouse issues. And that came about just understanding that when we talk about the lens of marginalized communities, sometimes single airmen and joint spouse and joint spouse too across services are, you know, that demographics, our policies don't always address those two, those three really um, populations. Um, you know, they're kind of centered more towards something in the middle. And it's been amazing. And we essentially, with, with our marching orders from COMAC, once those got approved, we um, collect initiatives and they fall within those buckets. Thank you for that, Major Arana. Um, for Chief, um, I just want to ask you a question, the same, represent the ARC. Uh, what process do you guys go through to pick what priorities you guys are gonna work on? Yes, ma'am, it's a great question. And again, we're all pretty different up here, uh, you know, different but the same. Uh, so during our initial setup, we went through an eight-step barrier analysis process to identify which LOEs we were going to work uh, towards and, and kind of implement across the Air Force Reserve Command and the Air National Guard. So we stood up those nine LOEs. Uh, they, they started at, in late 22. Those nine LOEs are, are still continuing on today. Some of the LOEs will have their own sub-LOE. Say, for example, if there's uh, child care or EFMP, things that go under uh, legislative or policy change, it may have a sub-LOE in there as well. Um, but that's how we did our framework for our nine LOEs. And really, that's a lot for us. So we, we are not gonna add any more on until we start closing some of those, because we do, we, we wanna get to the end, you know, to the finish line with all of these and, and see them out to their fruition. Um, some very interesting things, though, happened during these LOEs and the stand-up of these LOEs, and I'm going to hand it off to Lieutenant Colonel Collier um, to talk about some data that we found when we peeled back the onion and we found some more things whenever we were establishing the LOEs. Thank you, Chief. Thanks, so I think one of the, the beautiful things about Athena is is the flexibility in it is it really is based on grassroots initiatives and and we already mentioned on the panel so much of it comes from airmen's stories and so what i found you know and our network is built on volunteers almost everyone who's giving of their time it's because of a personal story so for me i was drawn to arc athena primarily from Chief Shotsman's personality and passion, <laughs> but, but also from my experiences as a single mother going through EOD school, as a now dual military family, uh, being a pregnant squadron commander. So there's things that we brought, that we bring, and it's the airmen's stories as we, as we stood up our nine lines of effort and we started to, to put forward, to peel back that onion. So for one of them, for LOE2, which is pregnancy discrimination maternal bias, we didn't have time to actually go through the formal process to create an Air Force survey. It actually, there is a process to it. You need to involve experts. So what we did is we did an informal questionnaire. We used all the networks that we had. We had 20 questions and we just put it out there through those networks to see what information we could gather. We did it to as many reserve and guardsmen as we could. Um, and what we found is in LOE2, the responses that we were getting, although anecdotal, you know, they were statistically significant as far as what they represent for the 189,000, but there were stories of guardsmen out there who were having to provide negative urinalysis tests to be given orders, to go on active duty operational support, to go to PME and residence. And so, although not a violation of policy, you know, it, it boils down to guardsmen and reservists, the status that we're in, the ability to go on prolonged orders, you know, to be worldwide qualified and not have a medical condition such as pregnancy is treated. Um, that became a priority to LOE2, and it was something that we didn't know when LOE2 was established, but something that we uncovered through their efforts. So, so hearing, you know, having that avenue for the airmen's stories, having that flexibility that as we close our sub 
elements or sub LOEs to be able to, to add in new. That really is the most beautiful thing about our Athena. Thank you, ma'am. So the theme for today is actually called Strength and Unity, which is, uh, which is here to highlight the value of networking and likewise the evolution of social interactions. With each of you stationed across the globe, uh, continent to U.S. particularly, I know you all don't have a chance to actually network in person a lot, but I did learn that y'all enjoyed each other's company last night over <laughs> dinner and libations. So with that said, um, I do want to ask this question, more so for you, Major Keen. How important has this networking been to you all, and how are you guys facilitating that cross-collaboration across different Athenas? Yeah, so I'd say, I, I think you've kind of heard that theme throughout everybody's uh, talk today, is that we have strength in numbers and strength in our diversity and our backgrounds, and so I think it's absolutely critical that we continue to work together. I think that we wouldn't be nearly as successful as we were, and probably, uh, wouldn't have made as quick of strides with the uh, blanket waiver for blanket acceptance of risk for Bluetooth breast pumps on air, aircraft had Sword Athena not laid that foundation for secure facilities first. So we really all build on each other. I'm working directly with some of the teammates on Reach Athena for some of our LOEs. Um, it's really a critical piece. And I think that some of our speakers have really highlighted this, that, that our diversity and collective cognition uh, provide an un unstoppable team who's able to m solve these wicked problems that we're facing. Um, and, and really, as Colonel Black said this morning, that we have really built an incredible tribe here, and that has made us all really successful. And then, um, I was taking copious notes earlier, but I do believe, I think, uh, Major Meister says you're one of the youngest or newest members to the group. Is that correct? Can you repeat that? Are you one of the newest <laughs> members to the group? Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay. And with that, how important has networking been for you over the last year and a half that you've been a part of the Athena program? It's extremely important to network and, and build off of each other. That's how working with the other Athenas, which, by the way, I don't know if we've said every MAGCOM has an Athena. This isn't it. But... Um, Working together, that's how change happens across the DAF level. Um, this is a role, completely voluntary, by the way, on top of our normal jobs. This is what we do for fun, right? Like after duty hours or whenever. But um, sh this is not a position that you can hoard information. You have to share. You have to share what you, what, who you talked to or what is coming up on the horizons or where are we going like you have to communicate and I think that's super important and we do a really really good job doing that um, with all the other Athenas so yeah. thank you for that and one of the things that uh, Major King just mentioned earlier was the importance of supporting each other which leads me to a question from uh, online one of the attendees asked and this question is uh, for you uh, chief um, the question is what policies can reserve units facilitate to help support nurse and mothers who have to travel to, on official duty without their children? For example, proper milk storage, shipping, et cetera. Well, that's a great question to whoever asked that because our LOE 6 is actually trying to uh, rewrite the JTR right now. Uh, that's actually one of the things that they're gonna talk about. We have an event coming up April 29th, 30th. There's a QR code outside. Um, anybody that needs information on that, whoever is who, who asked that specific question, uh, please get a hold of us and uh, we can give you further information on that specific event. We can align you with that specific LOE. We are trying to uh, make it possible to where you can ship that breast milk uh, in a shorter period of time. We are allotted up to $1,000 um, right now, but that's only over three days. And if you go on a drill status weekend, that's two days. So how does that align with us? It, it really doesn't. So that's one of our team efforts that we are actively working on right now. So whoever asked that question, please get a hold of us and we will be the connective tissue to align you up with that LOE lead and they can give you more information. And quite frankly, if you'd like to be a part of the change, you're more welcome to. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, another question online before I, I'm going to just give a little preamble, but certainly we've been told that it's important that we just each other's crowns as women uh, without letting others know that it's, uh, it's crooked. So in light of that, the question online is essentially, what advice do you have for women who are uncomfortable correcting another woman in, the areas, in many areas to include hair standards? And I'll let any one of you all answer that. I didn't take that one. Um, <laughs> so first of all, I think it's important to know what the reg is. And um, I don't think that this is just women being uncomfortable correcting other women. I think that we all need to correct one another because the intent is that you know, we're each other's wingmen wing people, I don't know what the word is for that now. But you know, we should be, we should be comfortable going up to each other and say, hey listen, can I just like fix the collar? 
as I'm over here flattening it out, you know, or just going up to someone and say, you know, I think your hair is a little bit long. Um, don't, don't be afraid. And I will say that it's a two-part thing. And for everyone out there who gets corrected, don't get defensive because someone's trying to help you out. I know that Major Arana would prefer to get corrected by one of my friends than, you know, run into a general who then is looking at me looking like a hot mess. So um, that would be my advice is just go ahead and do it. And maybe also the discomfort that you feel is really just your own, you know? And I feel like you would be surprised when you do correct somebody if you're doing it in good faith and, you know, with that intent of, hey, I'm just trying to help you out. It'd probably be more positively received than you would think. Thank you for that. Before I turn over to Q&A from the attendees here in person, I do just have one additional question, which is, um, Certainly, you all have told us many initiatives that have been successful. You've told us many lines of efforts that are ongoing, mm -hmm. and likewise have told us that there are opportunities to lay ahead, and certainly we all know that. In light of that, for those who are attending here in person, those who are attending virtually, and those who may know a friend and tell their friends about their attendance today, um, will maybe one or two of you all share with them how they can get involved with the Athena program? Um, well, I'll take that one real quick because we are probably the most different out of everyone <laughs> up here. Um, in that we don't take like rotating volunteers. It is ACC sort of Athena. We have a core team that is on ACC staff and I'm the lead for that. We are again, we are all volunteers and the core team, I'm not coming up with the initiatives. I am actually not doing the legwork on this. I would tell you that um, I have an amazing cadre of volunteers because every year COMEX sends out a message, it usually occurs in the fall or like January um, asking for one nominee from every wing and NAF. And so those nominees come here to Langley and we do our summit where essentially they get a week of its virtual training, um, learning about the research process, barrier analysis, and how to affect policy change. And again, it's also professional development. And then we do a one week in person at Langley where then everyone is broken up into their mission area working groups according to those four lines of effort or focus areas that I spoke about earlier. And then amongst themselves, they work through this process. And so the way, because we use this web tech model, it very much is intended that like every year it's you hit the ground running and it's, it has to survive first contact and it's fast. Um, so if you want to get involved, you just keep an eye out for that call. It goes through official channels. Um, and then again, it's one nominee for each wing or NAF. If you are at Langley and anyone listening out there and you're on staff and you're interested in helping out, I'm always open for like, you know, people to come on to staff because um, I need to find the next me also. So, um, but yeah, just hit us up. And we also are on Facebook. Um, you know, you can Google us, you'll find us. Thank you. Yeah. Lieutenant Colonel Collier, our chief, what about for the reserve uh, component? Well, I, I know Chief Shostman already plugged our, our second annual ARC Athena event that's happening at the end of April, um, which if you're a guardsman or reservist online, please work that registration. <laughs> um, we'd love to have you there and see you in person, but we do rotating volunteers because again, we have so much work to do, you know, nine lines of effort. We really want to expand our team. We just got our volunteer instructions. It's a volunteer sheet out through the Air National Guard channels. Believe it or not, it's sometimes difficult to get a full message out to the entire 54 states and territories, <laughs> all wings, all joint force headquarters. <laughs> we have a lot of folks in the Guard. Um, so we just got that out, whereas the reserves have been able to put it out previously. So we are taking applications for volunteers. We do ask that you at least have a signature so we know you have your supervisors or leadership support to do this mm -hmm. because it is, it, it could be time consuming. You know, we want active participation. We want volunteers who are gonna follow through and not just come to one meeting and drop off. But those applications, we're accepting them now. And after our conference at the end of April, we'll be making those assignments onto the lines of effort. So Chief, did you have anything to add? No ma'am, I think that summed it up. So we'll see you all uh, April 29th and 30th. <laughs> Thank you for that. We have about 10 minutes left, so if you have any questions, if you're here in person with any questions, there are microphones in the aisles um, for you guys to step into. We are projecting uh, virtually, and it's kind of hard to hear unless you talk directly into the microphone, so I'm just going to ask that you talk directly into the microphone. For those who are virtual, we're still able to, to take your questions, so please go ahead and type it in the chat box, so we'll go ahead and take those. Over to you, ma'am. Hello, uh, Kevi Kissler from uh, the 138th Electromagnetic Warfare Squadron of the Air National Guard. So my question is for uh, Colonel Collier and Chief Sassman. So 
for those who are working on, you know, the, the Athena movement or WIT movement at the local level, is there a repository of resources that we can access for the National Guard or the reserve units who might have different challenges from state to state since our leadership is a little bit more decentralized and the units are kind of a little bit more, I don't want to say isolated, but they're just more unique um, because of lower turnover? That's such a wonderful question. And one of our biggest challenges that we faced is the communication platform. And what I learned a lot uh, with working with the Guard is a lot of our members will have an army.mil and then they can't access Teams or they can't access the SharePoint. Um, so trying to be creative and find a, a website that works. And actually we just got our team established. It's an external engagement team that we are building a website platform so we can have a repository of information um, because everybody needs to access it and it would be easy for, uh, for everybody. Right now, that is one of the biggest things that, that we are working on because it is, there, there's a lot that goes into a website build and all the legalities that come with it and then especially when it comes total force. So I would ask of all of you, if you know anybody that's very comm savvy, please let us know because we will absolutely <laughs> add them to the team. Um, <laughs> But our, our goal is that we're gonna have this, the, the baseline repository to showcase at the event at the end of April. That's supposed to be our, our, our baseline. So uh, we're very hopeful for that. It's a great question and we can't, we can't wait to give you all that information. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. And for you, sir. Yeah, this question goes out to uh, all the telephone tough guys that love to show up on social media. Uh, so you represent the war fighting match comms. And uh, the landscape, the battlefield has changed from World War II and our previous conflicts to now. How do you see the diversity's impact on the national defense strategy? I'll, I'll take this one first, if that's okay. Um, I think that it was really highlighted yesterday how incredibly important diversity is. And um, I think diversity of thought and, and diversity of experience is so important because we're all gonna have blind spots. I didn't know that the standard issue vest for our defenders was too big for our smaller, our shorter statute airmen. And that also, that impacts both male and female airmen. So we are identifying issues at the, at the lowest levels and, and really that comes from everybody from their different experiences, bringing forward their challenges and bringing forward their unique solutions to these challenges. Thank you for that. Over here. Good morning, ladies. Just want to say thank you for, for being here and for all of your efforts. Um, I'm Captain Stephanie Barone from the Joint Air Defense Operations Center with the New York Air National Guard. And my question stems from experience. So I'm a 23-year career guardsman, uh, married to a married 15 years to an active duty Air Force member. Mm -hmm. Every time he PCS every one to two years, I would have to find a new home, reestablish myself. Are there any efforts for joint spouse for dual members serving in different components? So we don't, it is an issue, it is one that I relate to greatly. I, I'm married to a reservist PJ. Um, we made the decision, we've lived apart for years and years throughout our yeah, lives. Yes, um, been there. <laughs> so it is one that we have identified, we have talked about, I mean, I can actively tell you, and it spans actually all of our lines of effort, everything from childcare to, you know, some of the other things we're dealing with, like family planning, you know, lactation, IVF treatment. So it is, it is captured in all, line, all our lines of effort, but as far as looking at that policy of permeability and everything, we don't have an active subline of effort to work on it yet but it sounds like an incredible opportunity for you to join the team and to maybe start that. <laughs> yes, ma'am, but remember, seven different states. Um, luckily, he retired a year and a half ago, so we're, we're established where we're at, but happy to head up, and it sounds like there's several other members in here too that may suffer go, or go through these challenges as well. So thank you, ma'am. Thank you for that question. Next, go ahead. Good morning. I'm Master Sergeant Valdez, 17th IS Langley, 363rd ISIRW. So my question is for Major Arana. What is your makeup of officer to enlisted representation at Sword Athena? Um, thanks for the question. And hello, fellow Langlier. Um, so on like the, as you talk about the cadre themselves. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, especially since the wings um, put out that and then we have to kind of compete with each other to make it to Sword Athena. 
Right, I think that's interesting you said about the competing with one another. Um, one of the things, well, first to answer your question is we take anyone. Um, we are not looking, we don't see rank, right? And we don't see experience necessarily. What we want is individuals, um, when we sent out our tasker, we're very clear. Um, we're looking for individuals who have strong, um, you know, strong resources, as in like able to do research on their own, right? Um, people who are able to coordinate. Someone who has maybe shown something in the past. Have you been involved in any of the initiatives on your base, like locally? Are you involved in your wings, the women influencing the next generation? Are you part of your DNI council? That's what we are looking for. And so again, this year we had like a pretty strong makeup. I mean, our lowest ranking person was a senior airman and then we had up to lieutenant colonel and we had a mix of everything in there. I will say this year, we actually, the makeup was lower ranking than it was last year and that was a great thing because we were able to capture some of like the younger individuals, you know, and their experiences and not to, you know, as a, an elder as well, an elder millennial <laughs> up here, um, like we don't need all of me's coming up with ideas, right? Like we want a variety of ages, experiences, ranks, we want folks who live in the dorms and folks who aren't in the dorms. We want that, you know, the single, like, unmarried um, FGO, and then we also want the, the younger joint spouse couple. And so we're looking for that. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll take one last final question. Over to you, ma'am. Good morning. I'm Mass Sergeant Carrier from the 224 Support Squadron, Eastern Air Defense Sector, New York Air National Guard. Uh, my question is, what initiatives are being pursued to provide military families facing challenges in growing their families with the essential financial resources and support? And this is specifically um, accessing to financial treatments in regards to like IVF, IVF and IUIs. So we actually have a line of effort that's, that's looking at that right now, um, and that's one of their, their sub lines of effort is IVF in total. So what we can do is get you in touch with our leads for LOE number six. Uh, they're looking at talking with TRICARE, seeing what is accessible, what is not, um, coverage options, how they can link the two together, um, status-based options versus if somebody's on orders, if somebody's not, uh, what kind of insurance they have, and so on and so forth. So that is a, a line of effort that we are working. Uh, that's tied in also with the question earlier regarding the breast milk shipment. That's the same um, LOE. So we'd love to give that information out to you to get in touch with the uh, line of effort lead on that. Just to bounce off of that one, sorry. We also recently you know, updated the AFI so that for permissive TDY. And so now members, and while I know that you know, it doesn't pay for treatments, but at least now you should have your travel paid for and it does not leave if you do have to travel to seek fertility care. Um, so again, you know, it's sometimes the wins are, are step by step, right? We take, we crack that door open with one win and then we just keep going from there. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Oh, I, I was just gonna share that if you're able to come to our event, one, there will be an actual total breakout to talk about that very topic and then we're excited to have um, Believe it or not, a Marine Corps major come in and speak to us about those. She's also a lawyer in her civilian capacity. Um, so I understand she's, she's spoken at, at several events, but we're excited to have her be a speaker there at our event um, leading into the breakout. So we anticipate we're gonna have a lot of good information coming from her of what she has seen on the Marine Corps side and what we're looking at joint force wise. Thank you for that question. Ladies, certainly from the sound of your voices, this is an area that you guys are passionate about. So I thank you all for spending your morning sharing with our attendees your passion, the work that you all are doing in addition to your demanding military responsibilities, the successes you, are, you all have had so far, and likewise those that are to come. Um, so thank you all. For our attendees, just pause for a second. Our, our moderator is gonna join us for a few additional announcements. So ladies, thank you again for the work that you're doing to improve our DAF experience. That will end our broadcast for today. We will be back tomorrow online at 12.45 for our final presentations and closing of the symposium. See you all virtually tomorrow. For our in-person attendees, please stand by.